Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value payment, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to haters. How they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. So we got a special guest here all the way from Buffalo, New York, <laughs> who got nine and a half hours of sleep last yeah. night. He just wrote Make a sure book called it. Why You Don't Need More Than Four Hours of Sleep. <laughs> Guys, be ready. Michael Malice is bringing in today. I think we should have probably recorded three minutes before us going to the podcast. Literally, Tom was about to have his first fist fight. And it was going to be pretty intense. Him and Michael going at it, but it's yeah. going to be friendly. I'd Michael, like to see who's it's that good fight. to have you on the podcast. Wait, wait, wait. The anarchist side of the R- room R- in here. Russians don't use fists. We use knives. Oh. So there was not going to be. That's, that's, uh, yes, what, what it, do Canadians use, Tom? Or they use Apologies. That, or they use that. <laughs> No, not I'm the so- Quebecois. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Canadians don't apologize. Just the Quebecois, I'm which are sorry. sort of like I'm recycled sorry. French. <clears throat> Anyways, um, this is what happens when you when you have a guy uh, that comes on a podcast. It takes half a second. He describes himself as an anarchist. Is that correct? <laughs> that Michael is, Malice. That is how I describe myself. Yes. yes. Yeah. It, it, without uh, adjectives. Yes. He has a book. That just came out a couple months ago. The White Pill, A Tale of Good and Evil. Yeah. Mm. Michael Malice, the man, the myth, the legend, in the flesh today. Uh, how you been, man? How you doing? I am doing great, uh, relatively, yes. Yeah, relatively. So tell us your sleep pattern. You said you became <laughs> an author. I think the audience wants to know what is the... So uh, one of the... I had several reasons to become an author, yeah. none of which are particularly because I like writing books or I was particularly good at it. But I wanted ha, had a list of things I wanted to ha, uh, visualize and accomplish in my life. Never have to talk to someone I don't want to. Um, work for myself. Have a legacy, and also sleep in when I go my natural sleep pattern. So I go to bed at two a.m. I wake up at eleven, and this I've been doing this for years. So whenever I, that's kind of messed up, I am just. Uh, low key angle. Michael, you literally go to sleep at 2 a.m. and you wake up at 11. Every day, Monday yeah. through Sunday. It's so great. When, so when we said oh podcast God. 9 to 11, you thought it was late night. 9 oh, to no, no, 11. no, 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 no. I didn't think that at all. You said, come do the show. And I said, sure. Then you're sure. like, oh, it's 11. So you did a bait and switch on me. Yeah. You well, never have a morning meeting in your life. <laughs> Michael sends me a message. I, I used to do Glenn Beck's show uh, in the morning, um, yeah. and that was hell on earth. I'll okay. say one thing. Uh, Back in your the day schedule when he was in it, Texas? Is, is the exact opposite of what I was looking for in my life. Because I used to work in nightlife in Miami. Right. And I was sick of waking up at noon every single day. I would go to bed at 4 or 5 in the morning, a little later than you. Right. Oh, and gosh. wake up at noon. And I was like, I got to get my life together. But that this is my biorhythm. Hey, listen. And that, what's the buddy. point of being successful if you can't set your own terms? Michael, if those are your body, you worked in what, what the audience wants to know is what are your pronouns? That's that's it. Right? That's also... <laughs> Sir. Okay, Sir. I got you. And that's if you can somehow know. convince Pat to get on your schedule, you are a great salesman. Well, well, it, gonna, it, she should be on his schedule. Yeah. It might not work for him. You yeah. should yeah. take advantage me. of the whole pronoun thing. Just make your pronouns tired and shut up. I'm not tired. I'm just kind of. That's his pattern, Tom. Yeah. Two Let to the 11. man sleep. What's Tom? wrong with that? You, you know, you know what's crazy. So, so yesterday, while we're talking about this, yesterday I do my, the the executive physical that I do every every couple of years. You go in at six thirty in the morning, kind of time time you wake up, <laughs> <laughs> and and they literally take you from doctor to doctor to doctor, and they test everything. Right? They te- check your heart, your skin, your breathing, your you know everything. They do. It's phenomenal. You see nine or ten doctors in a span of nine hours. Okay, <clears throat> and. The lady asked me a question. She says, so how much sleep do you get per night? And uh, I felt compelled to sell her my sleep pattern. I said, listen, I just want to let you know, there, you know that aura ring thing that you people wear. So, yeah, so I wore it for like six months. And it's not how much sleep you get. It's how much deep sleep you get. Ooh. Because according to aura, I get a lot of deep sleep. And she says, really? I said, yes. She says, you still need to figure out a way to sleep seven hours a night. Because I'm doing four to six, whatever the time is for me. And I said, look, it works for some, it doesn't work for yep. some, but it is what it is. And I think that's what it is. Some people are, you know, the whole morning person, night person. Mm-hmm. I think there is some truth behind that. No, that certain if, people you're, are if night you're awake night. in the morning, you're not a person. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> um, but it, Early bird is not getting the worm but, in your house. No, they're, they're getting the shotgun. But, Roosters. Why, why, why are they waking me up? 
Uh, yeah. But the thing is, I think extremely po- extremely successful people often are the ones whose uh, evolutionary advantage is they get by in four hours of sleep. Like Clinton had four hours of sleep. Yeah. Thatcher famously had four hours of sleep, yeah. and they could just get by. You're yeah. getting nine hours. Of sleep. I'm getting nine. So I'm a failure. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm like modern. Joe day Biden's day. getting I'm twelve a, to fifteen. We hear <laughs> sleep. Well, if there's anything you're not as a failure, people love listening to you, your opinions, but get maybe people thinking. But maybe you, they're failures. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's that's a, that's a perspective to have, right? Yeah. You're failing. I'm winning. I'm Michael Malice, yeah. right? I'm the white pill guy anyways okay so for the audience that doesn't know you michael take a uh, um, we did a podcast together yes. it was a zoom it was the first time we had an yes. interaction together and i was trying to learn about you a lot of people kept saying pat you got to talk to this guy you got to talk to this guy we had a great conversation i enjoyed it, it. Very yeah, that's why i'm here and awake yeah. and he messages me says you said i thought we had a good conversation i'm like michael we had a very good conversation we were trying to get on the podcast so our booker when you and you and uh, we were trying to get a time to get on the podcast, right. they're like, "Hey, Michael, not right now, maybe later." And, and any, anyways, we eventually made it work. Wait, that's You're, not what happened at all. You, so he said, "Do you want to do the show?" I said, "Yes." I don't hear from him. I check in, and then he goes, "They're not interested." It wasn't later. It was like it's a no. But the guy's name is who? Who was Alan the something? Alan. That's not our booker. Right. That's our booker. <laughs> that well, is our he booker. also texted my sister somehow. Yeah. So, so, so did I, by the way, but that was a separate well, thing. Well, she, 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 Alan wants to date your sister. She does for you. She, she likes her sleep also in different you, ways. You know, you know, I, 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 uh, <laughs> was that a subtle? <laughs> How is, that, how, how is that subtle? There's a, there's like, so listen, strange. you want subtle? I'll do it at 11 p.m. <laughs> Michael, give us your background. So, how how, how does one like you? Uh, <laughs> they don't. Become, no one likes become, me. <laughs> become, you know, who you are today with your ideas. Like tell us, tell us. <laughs> Where some do of you your get ideas. your ideas from? <clears throat> um, I don't. What do you mean? Can you? What do you mean by that question? Exactly like, what I ask you. Like, how did you come up with the ideas that you have today? Was it? Well, a, I didn't come up with them per se. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my ideas, being an anarchist. Uh, um, are historically, you know, I did something called the Anarchist Handbook, which we discussed. It yep. was a collection of uh, the tradition of anarchism, and this tagline for the book is the black flag comes in many colors because there are different schools of anarchism. But basically, anarchism is the understanding that uh, political authority is illegitimate, and uh, you do not speak for me, and everything else is just application. So when you're saying anarchism, uh, we, we've interviewed libertarians, Democrats, Republicans, progressives. I, for me, this is my first anarchist. Well, Dave Smith's been on. He's a very failed Dave, anarchist. Yeah, he's more. <laughs> failed. I like very Dave Smith failed. a lot. Yeah, I like so do I, but he's a very failed anarchist. He's your most frequent guest, I think you said. Yeah, we, when we podcast. did the lockdowns, we did crossovers yeah, to keep I think, I think he's a stud. But stuck. Like, I mean, okay. Right. He'll listen, kick your ass, bro. I, I know Relax, there's the line okay? about, I am Relax, la- Malik. Listen, I know there's that line about you got to wake up pretty in the morning, but to convince me that Dave Smith's a stud, you really got to wake me up early in the morning. Dave, Dave, Dave six hours of sleep. Dave's a six hour guy. You know, in his, in his mind, that's a stud. And by the way, you're talking to a guy that also respects people who get proper, ample amount of sleep. Okay. So he's part of the Ariana Huffington Stop. camp. But yeah. go ahead. Sleep, you're going to ask your question. Sleepy Dave. <laughs> Sleepy Dave. Well, anyway, so you're, you're unique. So for I guess part of Pat's questioning is yeah I know you need you're to be- a nice guy <laughs> I'm nice. Uh, <laughs> So for you, you're probably like, yeah, I'm an anarchist. It's like I roll out of bed at you know noon. It's what I do. I'm an anarchist. I, but for the most of the people in the audience, probably not too familiar with what the the substantive beliefs of anarchy are. When I hear anarchy, I'm like, this guy's a wild man. But you seem pretty, you know, nice guy. So explain what anarchy is and why people should maybe consider that <clears throat> for their ideology. Well, I, I remember when I was in college, we, I was taking a bioethics course, and there was this kind of chart that spanned the the range of what the bioethics range of ideas were. And in one char- one part of the uh, chart was legalism, which is basically the idea that what the government defines as moral is moral. And the other half is that antinomianism, which is the belief that uh, it, morals are independent of the law. And the, the author went on to say, well, since no one believes in antinomianism, it's somewhere else in this chart. Well, that is the belief in antinomianism, that something is not moral since, simply because it's legal, and something is not immoral simply because it's legal, that morality precedes law, and that uh, politicians or you know anyone else who kind of tries to assume authority have to be held accountable to a higher power, but also the belief that you know government, democracy, all these things are inherently illegitimate and can never be made uh, valid or um, coherent even. So you're saying there's a difference between morality and legality? Yes. And okay. I don't think that's a particularly con- controversial perspective, that aspect of anarchism. And then who, how do you define morality? Who's the, who's the authority on morality? There's, is well, it the Bible? Is it God? Well, is it Jesus? Is it Muhammad? How, where do you come up with morality? Is it human? Muhammad. That's, what that, that's it? No, that's where it is? No, as the, a Jew? The, as a Jew, yes. Yeah, it's Muhammad. I mean, I, I really bet on the wrong bank on this one. Um, no, I... I 
morality is something Rand, Ayn Rand talks about very frequently, and this again is independent of anarchism. Morality is something that we all have to deal with. We have no choice. We all have to face moral issues on a daily basis. We may not tend to think of them as moral, like, okay, am I going to go to the school to check up on how my kid's doing, or am I going to spend time at business, or am I going to be with my mistress? These are all moral questions, even though they may not be framed, but maybe the last one most certainly would be. <laughs> so the point being that morality and our conscience is something that is inescapable, uh, and there are very many mechanisms uh, promulgated by the corporate press to try to make things seem morally ambiguous or seem morally uh, um, incorrect. And this is just, you know, one of the other many reasons why I and so many other people, not specifically anarchists, ha have so much contempt for corporate journalists. Hmm. By the way, I just searched uh, 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 what is anarchy, right? Anarcho-pacifism, oh, okay, God, yeah. is a form of anarchism which completely rejects the use of violence yeah. in any form for any purpose. The main precedent was Henry David Thoreau, yes, who, uh, uh, through his work, civil disobedience, influenced both Leo Tolstoy and Mahatma Gandhi's advocacy of nonviolent resistance. Yeah. Right. So I think when, when you and I talked last time, I'm trying to, I asked, I said, would that be possible today in America? You were pretty confident that it wouldn't be hard to get there. So if if we if we wanted to, if if you had it your way, let's just say today. Michael Malice wins 2024 election on nine hours of sleep. Okay? How, how, am I running, how am I running for office? <clears throat> I know you're not, but let's just say if you are, okay? The Dream big. And, big, and you're, you're, a, you're able to do certain policies that you would like to implement in U.S., what would some of those policies be? You mean like what kind of guillotines? <laughs> there you go. That's one. French Revolution vibes? Who goes first? I, I, uh, I, I'm, I don't... Okay. This Great is what, question, This Pat. is what happens when you wake me up early. Great Who question. goes first? This, this is what happens Who's when you on wake the me up early. Block the mask there, stops dropping and it's like, all right, because I do have a list. No, um, I do not believe... <laughs> the list. I, I'm not even really kidding. I don't believe that someone can ethically be a politician and serve. But to answer your question in a different way, no, I'm not a pacifist. And the only policies I would be interested in doing doing is to uh, you know destroy as many swaths of government as possible and to have consequences for government officials as much as possible for their uh, depravity so get rid of uh, so if you don't then the government runs without having any politicians uh, uh, and uh, the people are managing themselves with the laws and the guidelines and the rules all of that that's that's kind of it's not it. necessarily they're managing themselves for example if I go to like a department store right there's a system of governance in place I can no shirts no shoes no services something like that there's some store will have you can return things some stores have it you can't return things so basically you would have this kind of localized uh, excuse me very localized very decentralized set, sense of governance because there's this kind of myth that uh, anarchy is the idea of no rules, but that's not accurate at all. If I go to your house, you know, if you're having a white party and I got to wear white, it's certainly within your rights to say you're not wearing white, get the F out of my house. So it is, you know, it is inescapable that someone is going to have jurisdiction over certain uh, areas. The point being to have someone insinuate themselves as the state uh, in between these relationships is illegitimate. How does that look like? So, so let's, yep. so... <clears throat> So you're saying it would be self-regulated, like we would self-regulate. We, we do that now. Again, I'm here. I I'm came at your time. I am doing your podcast. I can't just do whatever I want. I'm following certain principles. And then if I don't, at a certain point, you can either tell me to leave or if it gets extreme, you call security. So this is something that not only is not hypothetical, it's something we live 24-7, you know, 365 days yeah. a year. And uh, anarchism is, you know, voluntary cooperation and exchange is the basis of any healthy society. And the problems only come through public crime, governments, or private crime, yeah. criminals. So that if that's the case, uh, we're, we're right now... What country today is running on that system? So anarchism isn't a location. Anarchism is a relationship. So anytime you have two people or two organizations or two entities or more where they have no semblance of authority higher than them, that is an anarchist relationship. And let me give you a good example. We don't have a world government, right? So if an American, uh, I apologize for this, and if an American kills a Canadian in Mexico, who has jurisdiction? No one but they still have some mechanism in place between the three of them because every country is in a state of anarchism toward every other country. So anarchism, again, isn't like a place. It's a relationship between different entities. 
How does that work in interpersonal relationships? So let's say with a husband and wife or a, right, the husband, a business partner. Husband's in charge. That's it. Bottom yeah. line. <laughs> it's the best answer I'm going to hear all day. But. That's what Mah- Muhammad was right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it, it, it's, it almost sounds like you, you sound like a pastor. <laughs> it's like, you know, you got to have a relationship with God. It's, it's what it is. You know, it's not a re- Christianity is not a religion. It's, it's a relationship with God. You know, Muslim is not. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. But at the same time, if you say anarchy, so if if because the way you sound, you sound super convincing. OK. Ooh, right. And 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 you're a you're obviously very sharp guy. Okay. Your, your history stuff, you you. You know, guys coming up to you, helping out with writing. You do such a good job that they thank you, but they say, please, let's make sure we don't have to say that you did this because of your background and what you believe in. You're a very sharp guy with your background. You've been on Rogan. I don't know how many times you've been on Rogan. Uh, it's either eight or six. Okay, that's a lot of times to be on Rogan. How do you and, not know the number? So, he pulled two episodes because we had the N-word. In. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so Jesus. six. Got it. Talk so, about <clears throat> anarchy. Relax. Well, but, 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 okay, so... But well, you sound convincing. If it's that convincing, Michael, why aren't more people doing it? Is it the argument? Is I'll, I'll tell the, you. I'll, I can answer your question. Yeah, absolutely. So there's an essay in the Anarchist Handbook by Emma Goldman, and she gets into why the majority cannot reason. So the vast majority of people are not capable of rational discourse, particularly when it comes to politics. So any kind of and democracy exploits this. Uh, first of all, they don't often have time, but second, they often don't have the mental capacity. But again, it's, the popularity of an idea is not at all a testament to its veracity or lack of veracity. If that were true, then the funniest show in history would be how uh, the Big Bang Theory, uh, which, of course, I don't think anyone will say with a straight face is the case, but that's the most <laughs> popular sitcom that, that's uh, either now or has ever been. Ridiculous. So one of the, there are several reasons. One is why it's not more popular. People in power especially those who are in power illegitimately, have an enormous vested interest and enormous incentive to maintain their power and to increase their power. And for over a century now, uh, the state has been raising America's children as its own, uh, taking them since now they want it younger and younger, and inculcating them with ideas that if you received them for the first time as an adult, you would regard as absurd. But since you've been kind of trained to accept them as plausible since you're four or five years old, you don't even bat an eye when they're they're repeated to you as an adult, such as the idea that we all understand here in this room, maybe it's different for the Canadian, that uh, aristocracy is illegitimate, right? Just someone was born to some king, and now this guy's going to some queen, and now this person's going to have some kind of uh, um, position to dictate terms of your life, take money from you, this is crazy. But somehow, if there's a lot of your neighbors believe something, that they now as a group have the power to take your freedoms away, that is regarded as it's in in the anarchist perspective. It's complete as completely insane. Then, then what was the first anarchy community? What was the first anarchy community? The fir- I, I don't know what you would what you would consider the first anarchist. Well, community. I'm just googling it right now, and I put anarchy, and it says list of anarchist communities. So, Wikipedia. So which one would be uh, meaning? Because you said it's not a country. It's a relationship, right? That's what you said. But it's, again, it's so these these little communities are very much kind of the, in the anarcho-capitalist, uh, excuse me, anarcho-communist way, and they often didn't last very long. Yeah, I guess. So, but the idea of anarchy, what was the first inception of the idea of anarchy? What year was that? Again, it, it, it again zero. The year five thousand BC. Anarchism again is a relationship. So whenever you have people interacting with each other without any kind of sovereign or, or ruler over them, that is an example of anarchism working. It's not a place and it's not a time. Well, so an example would be two friends. Okay, here you go. No, no, but, but. Here's, I'll give you some examples. Okay, you ready? Here's some examples. Stop Googling, listen. listen <laughs> I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to read this to you. And then, how and then about you I give me the question. idea. Anarchy is a society without a government. Okay. Okay? It may also... I don't re- care what the computer says. I'm, gonna, I'm just... Because for me, it's, it's for smart guys like you, you don't need it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get... You know, I'm, I, I'm not people. there but, yet. But I don't think so, Wikipedia is... I know. Okay. Let me just read this, okay. Michael. Okay. So anarchy is a society without a government. It may also refer to a society or group of people that entirely reject a set hierarchy. Okay, Anarchy was first used in English dictionary in 1539, an absence of government. That's kind of what I was wanting to know. Like, when did it get started? So 1539, the idea not- came about, like, first time used in a dictionary. Pierre Joseph Proudhon adopted Pardon? anarchy and anarchists in his 1840 treaties what is property and then it goes into explaining the rest of it but go ahead you were going to say something about anarchy with just, a relationship of friends just because the word was used for the first time in a certain year does not mean the concept or the philosophy was original to that year or time i'll give you examples of anarchism working music cuisine mathematics 
astronomy. These are all anarchist systems, meaning there is no sovereign, there's no government regulating it. These are indiv individuals and organizations working together voluntarily and creating systems. Those are all examples of working anarchist systems. So go okay, deep. But the, the question becomes, can that be, uh, uh, can those philosophies, so, so for you, if anarchy is a relationship and it's used in those different uh, sects, Uh, then, then what would be an ideal situation for you for there to not be a government? Well, I don't I know about ideal because I think when you start getting into ideals, it starts becoming a little bit incoherent. But yes, not necessarily not be a government, but the understanding that the government is inherently illegitimate. And frankly, a lot of what the government does, and I'm sorry I have my back to you, by the way, uh, a lot of what the government does is a function of so many people being trained to regard it as legitimate and basically bend the knee when they don't otherwise have to. Interesting. You were going to say, go ahead with the music. You yeah, said, hey. So the, the examples we're using on the music side, if you can elaborate. I think part of the reason that Pat's Googling stuff and I'm asking these questions is because we generally don't know about this kind of stuff. So for you, you're like, I talk about this every single no, day. Come on. Not, yeah. No, no, I'm saying that Wikipedia is often a very incoherent and poor resource when you're dealing with... Fair enough, like but that. I mean, it gives us a, a good baseline for what's going on. I, I think it gives a bad... Ba that's my point. If you're starting with... You are a true anarchist, bro. I'm not a true anarchist. I can't even Google I, stuff. I just don't regard Wikipedia as really a coherent resource All good. when it comes to most things. I don't think it's a controversial opinion. Okay, so why don't we go a little bit more modern? While uh, Tom's got a question for him, can you, uh, uh, Rob... Maybe this is at his standard. And before we go into uh, uh, Chad GBT and what anarchy is, let us go to our sponsor, <laughs> Gold Co. Okay? With all the mess going on right now in the economy, the, all the mess that's going on with Silicon Valley Bank, all the conversations uh, people are having, uh, uh, even just this week, do I move my money out of this? Do I move my money out of that? Nobody can predict what's going on today. Not the biggest experts. Uh, 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 just a few months ago, a guy named Kramer, not even a few months ago, a month ago, Kramer saying, wow, Silicon Valley Bank, it's a good buy, it's this, it's that. And that's the guy that's supposed to be the one everybody takes advice from. <laughs> Boom. Next thing you know, Silicon Valley Bank, $200 billion company, goes uh, belly up. And now people are looking at other places that this could happen to, which we'll cover here in the podcast momentarily. This is the point. You can't predict the future. I cannot predict the future. The whole part is about how we can hedge against what could possibly happen. And one of the ways to hedge against a market crash is to have gold in your portfolio. A small percentage of your money you ought to consider having into gold. And the company we work with is Gold Co. We've done a lot of research on these guys. They got uh, plenty of positive reviews. I've talked to people that have worked there directly, people that I've known for 15, 16 years. And so uh, for us, uh, 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 Gold Co. is a six-time Inc. 5000 winner, 2022 company of the year with billions of five, uh, with mil uh, thousands of five-star reviews. And they've helped people like you and me place over a billion dollars in gold and silver. Value 10 viewers could get up to $10,000 in free silver and a, one, a free one-ounce silver Ronald Reagan coin with a qualified order. I don't think he was an anarchist. And call them today at 855-594-2758, 855-594-2758, or go to goldco.com forward slash PBD, goldco.com forward slash PBD. Rob, tell us what chat GBT. Maybe that's at, at Michael Standards, because Wikipedia is obviously questionable by everybody. Okay, you're right, yeah. What is chat, what, anarchy, yeah, exactly. Did you question it already or no? Is it, is it currently it's down? Capacity, but right. I may be able to try it over here. Yeah, Hang you on. keep doing what you're doing. When you get it, let us know. Yeah. You had one job. Yeah. Rob can't been, even get on Chat GPT. Rob, Sounds like complete anarchy what's going on in Chat GPT. <laughs> Rob Rob's so a had a rough couple of weeks, even though I know he's doing his best. But go ahead. So a question for you. Yeah. Every, every now and then, um, uh, whether it's missionaries or anthropologists, discover small groups of people, indigenous people that have hitherto been not discovered. And observation is they have some very basic mores and folkways, sure. and they've just sort of assembled among themselves. Would you call that anarchist groups no because they almost they always if i, I want to say almost always because i'm not an anthropologist but they do have a very rigid uh, uh legal and hierarchical structure there's a chieftain uh and and there are laws that are enforced so. and so the, and so even though absent influence of any of the government structures or but they do have know, a government structure they have a judicial system it's just primitive right they're can gonna have i finish to sure okay <laughs> um 
So they're absent any of like, oh, you live in Luxembourg and there's the king or whatever. They're, they've been absent that. There hasn't been an outside influence on them like that. They've just grown inside. But because they've grown a hierarchical structure, maybe it's patriarchal, whatever it is, that is their government. And therefore, they're, that's not an anarchist group. Right. And it, I think it also depends on the size, right? I, I don't think, I think some of these primitive societies are actually quite are not just like a dozen people. They're actually quite sizable and do have a functional government structure. Something that just came to my head. So where do you stand on the whole um, defund the police? Because obviously police or even military, this is part of government. I'm for police abolition uh, and, and having the market provide security. Uh, whenever you have the government having its security is far too important of a service to have a monopoly on it, let alone a government monopoly. And when you have a government monopoly on any product or service, the consequence is always strife, uh, uh, shortages, and, and uh, other negative externalities. So you want the free market to uh, be the authority on anything, security, well, I police? I wouldn't say the authority, but yes, the, pre the free market provides, which provides security far better, just the same way that provides food far better, education far better. Uh, and all everything else far better so, than would uh, um, the government monopoly. No, well, because there's no accountability when it comes to having any kind of monopoly. People understand this about you know if you had like let's suppose an oil monopoly, which never happened, but let's suppose you had an oil monopoly. That mo monopoly is not going to be accountable to consumers or the market. But when you have a m government monopoly somehow in security, everyone's like, well, what are you going to do? Well, the answer is to have decentralization and also to have uh, um, as much of an armed population as possible. And then, and, and how does uh, law and order constitution just basic framework of what's going on in democracy how would that uh, so factor in? um anarchism is the mother of order not the daughter so if you have again the best way to have order between any kind of peoples or organizations is to have it be voluntary and agreed upon. So we have contracts, right? If I go into a business with you, we sit down ahead of time and basically work out the divorce. We're like, all right, these are your responsibilities. These are my responsibilities. What happens if, you know, you get sick and you can't work it out? What happens if I get sick, if I don't fulfill my terms of the contract? So whenever you have any sort of voluntary um, interchange between two people or two or, or two or more organizations, it's going to be far more peaceable. And when you have far more uh, of an idea of self-reliance and you have accountability in the entities that are providing any given service, it's going to be far more um, efficient and far more pervasive and widely available. Mm -hmm. Food used to be a huge problem even in this country. Nowadays, you know, the problem is there's too much food and everyone's obese. So clothing is another one. We make so many clothes. You know, back in the day, people had one pair of shoes and you had to wear it all your life. Now we have so many clothes, we're shipping them overseas and there's literally landfills of these crappy t-shirts. What do you think about communism? Well, that's the point of this book. Okay, tell us about it. Well, it's really bad. <laughs> uh, the point of writing The White Pill, and this has nothing to do with anarchism at all, um, the book. Uh, the point of The White Pill is I was kind of disquieted, you know, being born in the former Soviet Union, to what extent it has been almost being forgotten. And this is something that ended in our lifetime, the lifetime of everyone here and probably the vast majority of people listening as well. And what people went through for decades on the far side of the Iron Curtain was so disturbing and also so hard for us to wrap our heads around. We, let's, I don't know if any of you have diabetes. I don't, right? If someone tried to tell you what it's like living with diabetes, you're, it's going to be very different from actually living it, right? We can wrap our heads around, okay, I can't have candy. Are there other health externalities? You know, can I exercise? Maybe I'm going to, if I want to take a, a marathon, I'm going to have to do certain things. It, it's, it, we're still not going to get there intellectually unless you live it. So we can maybe understand, okay, I'm in school, I'm taught certain things, or someone's listening to me on the phone, or people get arrested and you're powerless to do anything about it. We can maybe understand each of those elements individually. But in terms of understanding that pervasive atmosphere, the tagline of the book, it's, let me get the exact quote. When Rand was testifying in front of Congress, she said, it's almost impossible to convey to a free people what it's like to live in a totalitarian dictatorship. So I tried to explain throughout the course of this book just what it was like. And even I don't really understand it. My protege was just in Prague. They have something there called the Museum of Communism. And they, you know what's great about this museum is it's not written this Western style in a scholarly manner because it's like, according to these demented ideas, we were all supposed to have food, but instead we were starving. And when I was when he sent me all the photos of the captions because I wanted to quote one for the book, it made me appreciate for the first time what it was like for my family in the sense of totalitarianism. You know, this is a stupid pun, but it, it's not a pun, but it means total. 
So it's everywhere. There's nowhere to go from the moment you're born till the time you die and you're told you can't leave. So let's suppose there's a politician you hate or you hate politics in general. You hate Trump. You think Biden's a fool. You can watch sports. You can listen to music. You can read books, historical books or contemporary books. Yes, you, they're trying to put politics into everything, but there's certainly very many venues where you could escape or even just talking to your friends. They didn't have that. And even just talking to your friends, you have to wonder, all right, did Pat turn? Is so, or someone, is someone, did someone get to him? Or is he just doing this for status, for money? So that kind of sense of having something, the government and that ideology govern every aspect of your life is something that I think is important for those of us who love any semblance of freedom, Republican or Democrat, to appreciate. So, you know, th that argument, again, uh, um, goes to that could work for those that are independent they can take care of themselves uh but if 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 you if you can't and you and i have to police everybody do i already want to deal with police and everybody Wait. do i already want to you know if if there isn't uh so, so what are you, you growing think, your own food? What, what do you think about law and order? What do you think about law? What do you think about law and uh, order? Wait, hold on. Are you growing your own food? What, what do you think about law and order? I, I am favor of order. I don't think law is a good mechanism of getting order. Okay, so what order are you a fan of? Just the people in a community deciding what it is? or is? I'm in favor of people behaving peacefully, which is uh, overwhelmingly the norm. And in fact, the problem is that so much crime is granted legitimacy and is not punished as a consequence due to having a government monopoly on policing. Okay, so you're not a fan of law. No, I, I think having a monopoly means that product or service is not going to be distributed well, or if at all. We have right now, and no one even thinks this is weird. Prosecutors, a lot of times, will be like, yeah, I'm not going to prosecute this. How is that law? That's crazy. I understand you're taking one, one element of it, but if you... Uh, we had Gordon Chang on. I don't know if you know Gordon Chen is. So Gordon Chen, uh, who lived in uh, China for 20-some years, and... Uh, he says China was a mess when there was no law because little to no law. And he says in 1984, some number like that, he said there was four uh, uh, universities that gave away law degrees because it wasn't something that was popular. And they realized capitalism uh, doesn't work without laws because somebody can bully and take advantage of the other person. What is your POV of not needing laws? Wait, wait. I, I, I find it, it crazy to think that there's no bullying in China, especially via the state. I mean, the whole the, point of the communist a system— A lot less than before. This is why their uh, innovation grew the way it has the last 40 years, because they added laws, which they didn't have before. But they, they did have laws, but that law was basically the will of whoever the CP official was. Like, and that's the problem. The problem is the laws don't apply to you know a Joe Biden or Donald Trump like they would apply to you or me or to someone who's much poorer than us. Uh, if you had a system where services are provided uh, by freedom, uh, it's going to be a lot more equitable and it's going to be a lot more coherent because if I am trying to get – I'm promoting a product or service, I need to be able to put my money where my mouth is. Whereas if a cop shoots someone, it's like, well, oops, you, you, you're just going to be suspended and get a pension. It's absolutely – the double standard standard between something with a monopoly and something that is provided when there's an element of competition is just night and day. So you're saying if there's no cops, people won't rob. I, I'm just saying there's no, I was saying if there's no government monopoly. If there's no government cops, if let's, you, if, let's I'll, just say there's no government cops. I'll give you an example that's happening. Yeah. This isn't hypothetical. Yeah. So everyone here, if you go to a bar, which is full of young males, full of testosterone and alcohol, it is still safer there than in the places where the government is providing security, such as uh, city parks at night, alleys, the subways. When you have, there's no incentive for a government monopoly to provide its service. And in fact, the worse it provides its service, the more taxes the, the politicians are there in a position to demand that the populace pay in because they could say, look, we have a problem. We need more of this. We need more of that. So when things are provided privately and you, at hotels is another good example. Yeah. Everyone in a hotel is uh, not um, native to the area where they're in. It's still safer in a hotel than in public housing where everyone actually lives there and you know who lives there. You sound so convincing. It's but not how do you fun. argue with this? But, but here's a part. You sound so convincing. If your ideas are so perfect the way you sell them, how come others are not implementing it? You, you, you can't tell me it's because 
well, uh, you know, the way uh, the world has uh, ruled is the people of power are so power hungry that they eventually go up there and all of them unite and they don't want to do anything and they're not willing to give up their powers and their privileges. And this is why the idea of anarchy has never been because I get it and these other guys don't. Right. So if it's so perfect the way you do it, I didn't say perfect. If it's if it's as good as the way you sell it, right? Why aren't smart people out there implementing it? Because the government co-ops smart people. The whole point of our university system is to train the next generation of elite. maybe eighty percent. Do you want to hear my answer? Or maybe eighty okay. percent. There's a couple of things. First of all, is I should, I think all of us would agree here yeah. that alcohol prohibition was a bad idea, which did not I, I don't think at all decrease the amount of alcohol consumption in this country, or maybe marginally but vastly increased the amount of crime in this country. How was it that alcohol prohibition was such a popular idea that it got two-thirds of the Congress and uh, was it three-quarters of the states to ratify it? Because there's very many examples. Uh, the, to broader speaking, politics are non-rational. There's an entire system in place where people will vote for their tribe as opposed to the other tribe and not really care if any of their ideas or views are implemented just so long as their team wins. And we, we this is something we're taught. If you ask conservatives, why are you voting for Dr. Oz? He supported Jesse Smollett. He supported uh, uh, trans kids. They're going to say, well, what do you want me to do? Vote for Fetterman? This, these are my only options. So we're trained since kids that your only options are voting and, and the two disagree. choices are Republican or Democrat. No, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with, uh, with what you just and said. And also or, one more thing. Just uh, Sorry, sorry. this yeah. is very key. Because uh, um, Noam Chomsky, who's also an anarchist, a, a prominent linguist as well, he has this great quote. And I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to butcher the exact wording. He goes, the way to control a society is to have strictly delineated terms of argument, but have very vigorous debate between those uh, terms. So you're, uh, Jimmy Dora, I don't know if you ever had him on the show, just great I'm dude. surprised that Noam said that, and when I asked him if he would ever debate Thomas Sowell, he avoided it. For, well, I'm not surprised. That's surprised yeah, I'm, I'm very surprised he didn't want to talk to but, Thomas Sowell. You know, Jimmy was on two weeks ago. Like Jimmy's that. great, but yeah. he he, he, he gave an example of this. Like, if you watch, like, The View, the choices are going to be, should we, can I curse? Yeah. Should we bomb the shit out of Syria or should we bomb the fucking shit out of Syria, right? We're always presented with a very limited range of options on, and then you think, okay, I either have CNN or Fox, but that's basically where the Overton window lies. So any ideas that are a radical threat to the governing structure are going to be marginalized and you're going to be told until very recently where you had independent venues like this, that you're crazy or this is impossible or it'll never happen. And for many people, there is a, still to this day, there is a huge social cost in adopting an, there's a huge social cost in adopting an ideology that is regarded as marginal or unpopular. I don't know about that. I don't you know don't about think that. it's a social cost? No, I, 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 okay. So what I think you're doing is super necessary is because you're, you're making people think, right? You're making people think and say, okay, he sounds convincing. He sounds very confident. Doesn't necessarily mean you're right, but it's good the fact that you're we're having this discourse, right? And the audience can be like, "Well, Pat, he made a good point. You don't know what you're talking about. You need to do your research on this. But you got to go read this." Here's one. Okay, well, Michael, you, Patrick asked that question. You didn't really give the right answer. No? Great. Let them decide on what they want to sure. do. But but here's the part. So what I think has happened the last few years is we've shown with this tool, we got right now, whatever, 9,100 people live watching. By the time this is going to be done within a two-hour period, 100,000 people will watch it, 24 hours, all the clips together. Say we got four or five million people that watch this to get this argument. Okay. We didn't have this 20 years ago. Correct. Right? So 20 years ago, Michael Malice, you would have had to go gone the traditional way of maybe instead of sleeping nine hours, you would have slept in seven and a half hours to make it because a tool like this isn't out there to market it. So it would have been much harder for a guy like you to make it to where you are today, right? Today, the tools allow you to live the life that you've always dreamt about living, which is phenomenal. Yes. However, here's what I think is this tool is given. And you may disagree. If 20 years ago, somebody said, guys, in 20 years, Trans people are going to be accepted. Men are going to be transitioning into uh, women and competing. And the Democratic Party, who's always been, they claim they're for women, they're feminists. They're going to be okay with men saying they're women, competing against women, beating records, and they're going to be cornered to, and, and trans, they're going to be all over the place. And Drew Barrymore is going to bring a person in, Dylan, and she's going to get on her knees in front of him and say, I totally understand your pain. 
that'll never happen. I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen. But let me tell you what else is going to happen. What's that? You know, the, the CNN, the Fox, all these guys, yeah, what about them? They're going to get crushed by this guy named Joe. What are you talking about? Just regular Joe. It's just a regular Joe. He's not a regular Joe. I'm telling you, CNN and Fox are going to be crushed by a guy named Joe. What does this guy do? Is he a billionaire? Does he have more money than them? No. He just talks and makes people think and brings different people on. So what has he done? Do you know marijuana that is illegal today? Yeah. That guy's going to make people think marijuana is not a big deal. And matter of fact, he's going to bring the richest guy in the world on, <laughs> and that guy's going to smoke weed. And then he's going to, the next day, the market's going to come after him, but now smoking weed is no longer what it was before. Get the hell out of here, Michael. You're out of your mind. That'll never happen in America, conservative. No, it is. It is. I'm telling you. And you're not even going to think twice. When you, last week, I'm in Bahamas three, four days ago. I mean, the other day, I'm in a, a game. We'll walk by my kids. What is that smell? It's a, a what is that animal that smells like weed? It's a, a, a skunk. Skunk. It, oh, that's what a skunk smells like? Sk- you didn't know skunk? Yeah. Wacky that's tobacco. a skunk. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's a skunk sound. That's what it is. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. That's not skunk, man. It's like five minutes later, Dylan's smiling. I'm like, no wonder this guy's so happy right now. So <laughs> no one cares about smoking weed today. 20 years ago, it was crazy. So this is the point I'm trying to make to you, Michael. And take this personally. I want you to get upset. I'm not going to get upset. And say, screw you, Pat. I'm not going to say okay, that. Okay, that's good. Here's what I would say. If the last 20 years, some of the craziest, wackiest, ideas are now being talked about and some of the things that the conservatives would have never accepted are now saying it's just weed maybe your argument isn't that good or maybe you're just not good at presenting your argument for other people to pick it up because if there's ever been a time to sell your philosophies to be received by millions of people around the world now is the time how come there's not been that kind of momentum yet the anarchist handbook hit number three on amazon uh 20 years ago that book wouldn't have been published uh, so if you're asking me why we haven't gone from uh, the state uh, in 2003 to anarchism today, I haven't been at it that long. Secondly, I don't think you're going to deny, regard uh, if you look at social media and other outlets, which are imperfect, but certainly uh, uh, loose vectors uh, or, or metrics, rather, by how I, popular ideas are, the views that I'm putting forward are infinitely more popular than they were 20 years ago. And it is a result of exactly what you're talking about. The fact that now you do not, when we were, before we were born, uh, I think you and I are around the same age, you had three television stations. And it's ABC, NBC, CBS. And if you argue, if you went back in time and you're like, you've got, they're like, we have choices. My friend really loves CBS, but he's an idiot. You know you got to listen to ABC. And what it all was was corporate media, and they all basically had the same message, if not, ba- it's not identical message. Nowadays, then Fox started. And it's like, oh, my God, we have Fox. we got to put Fox out of business. These people are crazy. I think most people on the internet now have to look at Fox. They think that the average age of a Fox viewer is deceased and that it is to regard Fox as a vector of kind of radicalism as opposed to maybe like a hardcore Republican outlet is absurd. You're not going to really find much radicalism uh, uh, on Fox other than maybe sometimes the mass drop. By the way, you know what would be Tucker. a great commercial? You know what would be a great commercial? You just gave, gave me an idea. If CNN or, or any of these guys wanted to kind of make a commercial to bash Fox, all they have to do is go uh, rent out a cemetery, put a TV there, and Fox TV all over the place. Oh, wow. And the only people that listen to Fox are dead people. Listen to CNN, listen to ABC. That'd be a, that'd be a pretty... But let me, so let me ask you this. So your, your position people. is that it's a great thing that this, tra- this trans stuff is happening in sports? Uh... No, I don't think. I'm just saying if, if a crazy idea like that has created this kind of momentum, how come your wonderful idea hasn't? Well, I don't think that ideas uh, necessarily become popular as a function of how true or... or uh, but I think Joe's idea is a great idea that created momentum. And people who were not on his side said that makes sense. R- right. So what yeah. I'm saying is sometimes great ideas do catch fire and become popular. And sometimes really deranged ideas do catch fire and become popular because we do because how ideas are formed in this yeah. country and in most country isn't a function of people sit down, they do the research, they look at both sides and they kind of maybe argue with their neighbors. This is just this enlightenment delusion about how people come to their political conclusions. People far often uh, read Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind. People come to their uh, um, political conclusions for evolutionary reasons, meaning I want the bandwagon effect. 
you know, when uh, after Kennedy was shot, they asked people who you voted for in the 1960 election, which was the closest election in American history. And the percentage of people who had remembered, I, th I think sincerely, that they had voted for Kennedy over Nixon was far more than the number of people who actually did it, because we tend to want to think of ourselves as being on the winning side. Low status people have an enormous incentive to not rock the boat because they're not in a position to kind of have radical ideas. Because think about it, if I go to an office and I have some kind of wacky ideology and I'm not empowered, yeah. right away I'm out group. So this is a, one of the many reasons why uh, ideas that are radical are not necessary. Yeah. But, but it's something broader. I don't care about popularity of an idea because I don't think politics is moved by the majority. Politics I, is often... I don't on. disagree. Poli yeah. uh, let me just finish. Yeah. Politics is always moved by an informed, uh, yeah. ideological, usually radicalized minority. <laughs> and this country was founded by a bunch of very small percentage of yeah. people yeah. who had a vision, and they didn't even bother asking the masses what they thought so, about so it. So then that, then that says, if since 1539 this has been an idea, how come it's died? I and don't it, think it's died at all. I think the idea that government is inherently legitimate is more popular I, now but than I don't any, think that's an anarchy philosophy. I think that is That's a, the definition of anarchy. No, but 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 a, a lot of people uh, both on the left and the right would agree that the government uh, is too big. Not the government. I didn't say too big. I, not the government. Government itself. The concept so of So in your world there shouldn't be a government. Or the idea of go the government is not legitimate. Yes. I don't think people would say the uh, legitimate define legitimate. Something uh, uh, legitimate for a government to be legitimate means it is in a moral position to enact its edicts upon its subjects. Okay, so so if if so in in other words, I don't think government is legitimate, meaning it's not necessary. No, it doesn't. Like I don't have a right to go in your wallet and take money, right? But somehow the withholding tax is where people think, well, you pack, taxes are the price you pay for civilized society. That, to me and to other anarchists, is not legitimate. How far off are you from uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy? Well, Rand hated anarchists. Uh, she's on the cover of the book. You know, she's, The first chapter is her testifying in front of the House on American Activities Committee. If you, it's funny because you know her kind of objectivism. I don't like calling it a cult, but it's, it basically has cult-like aspects. But what she describes as Galt's Gulch in Atlas Shrugged is effectively a private anarchist community. Who else is on that book, by the way? Uh, it's Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, Emma Goldman, and Elena Ceausescu. And why'd you pick those four? Um, I wanted the since the book is dealing about. Uh, starving uh, the Holodomor, starving millions of people in Ukraine, concentration camps, the gulags, um, the show trials, the Stasi, uh, and ultimately the fall of um, the Soviet Union and its uh, subject satellite states. I wanted the, there's a, the, Jane Wheedland was a singer, was, excuse me, the rhythm guitarist for the Go-Go's, and she had this comment about their music, which is very new wave music, that it sounds very chipper, but if you look at the lyrics, they're very, very sad. So I wanted the cover to be like, all right, the content is going to be very, very dark, but I want it to be like sunny and, and almost silly. Um, mm -hmm. So the cover looks like kind of like a 1970s like a movie poster or a play poster, and you would think it's kind of a romance novel, but I wanted to have that bright, sunny cover, given that the contents are so dark and disturbing. Michael, were you born in Ukraine? Yes, sir. Okay, so what do you think about what's going on right now in Ukraine? I don't think I have a very informed perspective on what's going on. My big concern, my background, you know, uh, we talked before, I did a book on North Korea called Dear Reader about Kim Jong-il. And my big concern is that we're facing a replication of the Korean War. In the Korean War, you had North Korea with the great leader Kim Il-sung, backed by Mao and Stalin, China, uh, Russia, uh, China and Russia, respectively. You had uh, Sigmund Rhee in the South, backed by the U.S. and the U.N. And what ended up happening is Korea, the Korean Peninsula, was leveled, and the devastation for the people was enormous. So I'm very concerned that there is enormous pressure, understandably, uh, to not reach any kind of settlement. Um, and that the people who are going to end up paying the price are the Ukrainian people. That's my concern. People who are going to end up paying the price are Ukrainian people if they don't find a way to settle. It, or even, it, it seems like there's no good solution here. Right. Because if they're settling and you're going to say, okay, not you, I mean, the, the argument is you're validating Putin's aggression, he's going to do it again. That's a fair argument. Then it's like, well, you can't settle, not give an inch, but then like, yeah, but you're, we're here in America, we're not paying the price. But in an anar anarchy philosophy, you got to kind of leave it alone, right? And let them kind of do their own part. I, 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 I don't think this is really a question of libertarian, Republican, Democrat, or anarchist. I think this is just a question of, right, what, are, what is the facts of the matter? And I don't think I have the facts on this issue. How is that possible? You're, 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 it's like your homeland. Like if something happens to this you. This is my homeland. No, I, I get left that. here. But I get that. But like even 
uh, is there any affinity to Ukraine for you? None. Zero. No, we speak we spoke Russian. Got it. I don't even speak Ukrainian. So you were born in Ukraine. But I left when I was one and a half, so it's not like I, I found memories. It's not like we left because it was so great. Yeah. And again, but this was the Soviet Union. So Ukraine in 78 is going to be very different from Ukraine in 2023. And also Moscow in 78 is going to be very different from That's Moscow. That's a little strange, though. You're a pretty well-read guy, and you're a pretty smart guy to say, I don't, like, uh, 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 you know, I don't have any uh, opinion on the country I was born in that's going, like, it's the topic of discussion on every single channel right now. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if there, so, so okay, so let's, do you support the fact that U.S. is giving the kind of money they're giving and they're uh, uh, helping them out in this war in a proxy war type of a thing that's going on? Do you support that? I would, I don't know because I don't know where this is going. Are we going to say that we're going to just fund it interminably? Yeah. Uh, is, or Because that seems to be the premise, in which case the Ukrainians are going to be emboldened to fight. And then one day, what are we going to do? Cut and run. And then they're left holding the bag. So that is my concern. Okay. It's, uh, here's the thing. It's not like Ukraine, Russia, or the U.S. are going to somehow regard, disregard the legitimacy of government overnight. So this is not a situation where there's like, a, like an anarchist answer or I'm in a position or an authority to speak for anarchism. Then, then, then if that's the case, the anarchy will never happen if that's the case. It's happening right now. This is us. This is anarchism. No, but this is at a very, very low level. Anarchy, well, let me, let me rephrase that. For anarchy to happen at the highest level, based on what you're saying, it'll never happen. But there is no highest level under anarchism. The whole point is that, if fine, if you want to say that anarchism yeah. can only work in a small community... Fine. Let us have our community and leave us alone. Okay, so that's then that's what you are. Then you would you would uh, you would much rather have your own community. You go live in with a bunch of anarchists, and you guys create your own they guidelines. Have, you got they, land. You're happy with. They that. don't have to be anarchists. I mean, it doesn't. Here's the thing. Do you regard if, if they're not anarchists? If, hold on. Let me if, ask. If, if if one of them is, uh, if one of them is ambitious, and he says, "Look, I, I have ambitions." In an anarchy system, that guy's eventually going to go and say, "Here's what I think we should be doing." And if that guy's got better ideas than yours or is better at selling it than you, then eventually it's going to convert into a different kind of a government no, when you die. Not, not, not necessarily because I don't think— <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. I'll, I'll, I'll answer I'd what. love to hear it, yeah. Better ideas are not the ones that always win out, as Prohibition demonstrated, because then we repealed it several years later. There's many examples in the markets where bad ideas work for a temporary period, then they're rejected. Um, but let me just speak to your point earlier. Do you, if the Chinese government right now passed a law yeah. that said everyone has to wear orange all the time, would you regard those laws as valid? If China did what? If, if China passed a law, an edict that said everyone, everyone on earth has to wear orange, would you find that as, as legitimate? It'd be weird. That's not what I asked you. Would you yeah. regard it as legitimate? Would you start wearing orange? No. Why not? Because they don't look Dutch. <laughs> Is that true? They wear orange in, the, in, yeah. in Holland? That's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wear it. That's why, why I'm not living there. Right, but why, why wouldn't you wear it? It's, it's, I like my choices. Okay, but do you regard their, that law as legitimate or not? No. Okay, so all anarchism says is that it regards Washington's laws as legitimate as those of Beijing. You can say that all you want. All I'm Thank saying you. to you is... You, you, <laughs> and no, I will. You should. This you is should, anarchy. But you should say that. That's great. But to, to think that this is at the top level, uh, you know... So, so if I ask you those questions and then I say, well, what do you think about what's going on with Ukraine? And, and well, it's, I'm not educated enough to come down. Okay. But you're from there. Yeah, but I'm an American myself. I, I understand that, but you're from there. Yeah, but I left when I was a year and a half. I don't even remember anything. I'm more like a, I speak Russian. Okay, I get that. But you have these ideas of anarchy in a situation like anarchy. What should happen over there? Well, we're not there right now for us to give that opinion. Then, then your argument loses weight because it can only carry – that argument can only be sold in low-level conversations, not at high-level conversations. A conversation that carries weight and momentum is, is – is got enough backing to say it would work if right now, let's just say the world was ran this way, here's what would happen between Russia and Ukraine. Leave them alone. Okay, then Ukraine would become Russia. Well, that's their business. Th that's not it at all. My point is I think it's important when someone gets on a mic to come at it from an informed perspective. And I think just because an issue is very popular in the news, that does not mean that it's – are you, are you going to let me finish or not? That does I, I'm not, shaking my head doesn't mean you can't finish. Uh, fine. It doesn't mean that I have to have an opinion yeah. on every single issue. And I think a big problem in our culture is that everyone feels to have an opinion on every single concern. 
I'm not a Ukrainian. I'm not in Eastern Europe. I've never stepped foot there since I was one and a half. So I don't, I agree with you. I don't know how anarchist principles would happen in the middle of a war between Russia and Ukraine. So I don't it, know who the good so, guys so are. So then it's, listen, then, then it's, so then it's a good conversation to have, you know, to go in on shows and all this other stuff, but it's, it doesn't carry enough weight on its own to rule and they, or to have a country around it. That's kind of what you're saying. But it's not, it, I'm saying it wouldn't be a country, it's a relationship. So number it, one, and second of all, hold on. I don't think that if the U.S. was communist, yeah. fascist, liberal, conservative, progressive, mm -hmm. I don't think any of those would inform the question of what should the U.S. do vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine and Russia. It's not a function of what government we have, what the right thing to do is over there. So, so it, do you have a vision with anarchy? I was just going to ask that question. What's your vision with anarchy? Like, in an ideal world... I there's no ideal world. That's the problem. It's not a utopian s a system. What anarchy... What's your vision? What's your vision with anarchy? My vision is a situation where more people are responsible for their own lives. Which we have today. I said more people. Okay. More people are responsible. Yeah. I don't think we have that today at all. Um, more people are responsible for their own lives. There's less of a reliance on corporate news sources. There's less respect for the university system. And there's an increasing amount of absolute contempt, if not levels of hatred, toward government and government officials. I think we have all of those that we're making progress on today. All I don't, of them. I don't I, agree. I, I would easily sell it to you. I think uh, Biden will go down in the history books, at least out of all the presidents that we've had, as the guy that drove more homeschooling than any other president That's in true. history of mankind. That's so true. I think we're making progress. Well, that was Trump. That was COVID. It's not Trump. It's COVID. It's it was not COVID. It was not either of them. But but it's it's COVID Biden because of what's going on with, you know, pushing these education. And even DeSantis, I would also say, was the spokesperson to drive people to consider saying, I'm either going to do private school, I'm either going to leave the state, or I'm going to do homeschooling. I think it's a combination of COVID, Biden, DeSantis together are driving that. So that's true. That's progress. Next one. The data that's coming out that says in K through 12 schools, 99% of health teachers gave money to the Democratic Party. 97% of English teachers gave money to a Democratic Party. And 87 out of 100 uh, uh, math and science teachers gave their money to the Democratic Party. That means they got a monopoly on that mindset that they're teaching the kids. And for every 13 professor or 12th professor that's a Democrat, one of them is a Republican. So these numbers are coming out and people are saying, that's not cool. So you're either going to create a university or I'm going to do online schooling. I don't even want my kids to go to college. Why would I want to send my kids to college? People are making decisions. We're making progress. progress and then yes. social media, you know, mainstream media, I, I think it's very obvious. Do, can you realize Jeff Zucker got fired when? When did Jeff Zucker get fired? Less than a year ago. I now, what's going on with Chris Licht? Where he's at? What you, what, what's going on with Chris Licht? He's either just got fired or he's about to get fired, right? Is he really? He's in, he's in a deep, you know, he's not in a good place. If you pull up, uh, Chris Licht about to be fired. So mainstream media, when Russell Brand goes on Bill Maher and annihilates an MSNBC guy to his face to the point where Bill Maher gets uncomfortable, we're making a lot of progress. When a number one guy that's pushing back on mainstream media is a former UFC, not a UFC, former fighter and, you know, actor, fear factor shows, and he's putting people in their place where they can't go around – you know, saying, hey, you better get vaccinated or else this. And all of a sudden people are saying, well, I kind of like what he's talking about. What is this about ivermectin? I think the progress is being made. Does that mean that we're leaning towards anarchy? No, it just means we're making progress. Because if on 100 different issues, if we wrote on a piece of paper, a, an anarchy, a libertarian, a capitalist, we may agree on 77 different things or 78 different things or 82 different things. And then... You may disagree with you on four different things. He said, "No, no, that's, that's a great libertarian. No, 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 Dave. You know, Dave. Somebody, no, no, it's like this. But you know what? There's a lot of things that we all want to see have progress happen. I think we're making it. Do we want to have a big government the way we do today? No. Do we want to see them printing money the way they're doing today? No. I think they're being exposed by both sides. Does that give credibility to the anarchy argument? I don't know about that. I don't agree with most of yeah. what you just said, but let me break down a few points where I disagree with. First of all, I don't think there's such a thing as big government. There's only government you approve of. Any government that is 
big enough to impose its will upon you will be regarded by you as a big government. And if a government is so small that the night watchman state where you could drown in a bathtub, then it's not in a position to impose any kind of weak law and order regardless. So there's no coherent argument for minarchism, number one. Second, I don't think it's at all accurate and I, I'm friends with Joe, I've been on his show several times, to regard his amount of influence or amount how much he's trusted is in any way comparable to the New York Times or to someone who's a law professor at Yale. These are, to me, still night and day. Uh, I don't think at all there is a view of both sides, if you mean like Republican and Democrat or liberal or conservative, that they regard the state as illegitimate. There is no incentive and no move in Washington, let's just take from the conservative perspective, to shrink the size of government by one dollar. You had Trump and two years of a Republican congressional majority. There wasn't even an attempt to abolish a single government agency, let alone to shrink the size of the government. So this idea that if you want to be kind of have a libertarian perspective and say people are realizing government's too big, even if people are realizing this, there's DeSantis didn't shrink the government at all. I think he grew it even faster than his predecessor. So in terms of you know 77 out of 100 things, if you and I both have the exact same vision yeah. of a house we buy, what we want it to look like, and you want to sell it and I want to move in, we do not have the same goal even if we have the same vision. Yeah, but in your world, it's your way or the highway, Michael. And, and that's very hard because... The, 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 the way you sell your ideas. Our conversation started off when, you, when I asked you and you said, well, you know, my book is ranked number three on anarchism and da 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 da, da. On I'm Amazon. Making, on Amazon. And you say, and I'm, I'm not, and I'm making progress. Great. All I'm saying is progress. Progress. I didn't say it's happening. I'm giving you your point back to you. We're making progress. Joe is making progress. Joe is not New York Times. We all know how big New York Times is. It's massive. It's a behemoth. But we're making progress. Elon Musk buying Twitter. It's progress. All of these things are progress. We are making a lot of progress towards the concept of freedom of speech and people questioning things they didn't question before because we're all collectively getting smarter and saying, this shit just doesn't make sense. We're, we're not getting smarter. We're getting more informed. I'm going to be pedantic on it because that's important because I don't think people are necessarily getting smarter, but we have more access to information. That is crucial, and that's what brought down the Soviet Union. But again, you're, I think you're kind of mixing up several things. You asked me earlier why you know anarchism— I'm not mixing up anything. I'm just telling you we're making progress. And just like you're saying, you're, you're, uh, uh, the argument of anarchy is making progress, I think collectively— more people are informed today, whatever definition you want to give it, informed or smarter, more people are informed today to realize this shit doesn't work, we're unified. When a Bill Maher, what are we talking about? Like, Russell Brand? Are you kidding me? Like, when Bill Maher and Russell Brand and Joe Rogan, who endorsed Bernie Sanders a couple years ago, when they're coming up and they're saying, here's where we are, nobody in a million years could have guessed this was going to happen. But, okay. The weirdest people are unified today, which I believe is major progress. But go ahead. You were asking earlier why anarchism isn't more popular, right? And I was giving you examples of, A, we're making progress on that issue. Mm -hmm. And one concrete objective, as opposed to my personal feelings, is the fact that the book hit number three on Amazon. So I agree with you that we're making progress in terms yeah. of both understanding the nature of the state and the power elite, and also more specifically in terms of promoting anarchism as an ideology. Point being, I'm not a utopian, right? So even if I had, for example, a magic wand and uh, marijuana... But you are, though. You are a bit of a utopian. And by the way, Michael, Michael, let me manage something with you. In a conversation that's two hours, I may jump in and interrupt. That's you. fine. If it makes you uncomfortable, it's going to happen 50 more times. I understand that. If you interrupt me, I'm fully comfortable. You're not going to offend me. I'm a big boy, and I'm okay. expecting you to be a big boy as well. I'm a very little boy. Perfect. That's <laughs> totally fine. Okay. Yeah, totally fine. And I should be in my bed. <laughs> yeah, you should be in your bed, and you chose to be here. I'm not a utopian, okay. and, and I do not appreciate being called a utopian. Because right. what I was about to say is, if... All that happens is drugs become legalized. That's nowhere close to an anarchist society. I'm not going to say, fuck you, that win doesn't count. That's a huge win. If people aren't put in jail for illegitimate reasons, I will take that as a goal. I will ac accept it and celebrate it. The reason I wrote this book, uh, yeah. The White Pill, was about the fall of the Soviet Union. The people in Russia, Ukraine, Romania, they're not living in some utopia. They just Things just got significantly better for them. And that is important for those of us who fight for freedom. You take the wins you can get. And you don't say, oh, well, they still have this law or they still have that law. No, you go, look, things in our lifetime, 
uh, in places that are not some weird country that you can't find the map, moved fundamentally, enormously, in a better direction, and they did it relatively peacefully and relatively easily. And that, to, to your point, which I agree with, it, uh, is something that is important for those of us to stay motivated who fight for freedom. So that this is why I think the anarchism question in this context is a bit of a distraction. You don't have to believe in anarchism to still fight for freedom and to work with me and, and other people who think like you and to take the wins when you have them. Yeah, so, so what I like about, uh, you know, competition is, is if your ideas are great, you can attract good people. You'll attract money. People will come to you. If you don't, you're going to lose good people, okay? At this table, his family's from Canada. Tom doesn't live in Canada, okay. right? Uh, you were born in Ukraine. Yes. You don't live in Ukraine. Correct. Right here. Yes. You live in Buffalo, New York. Yes, right. right? I was Sunny Buffalo. Sunny Buffalo. <laughs> By the way, that's a joke. He's he's in Austin, and 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 you know, which is sunny, which is sunny. Yes, I was born in Iran. Okay, I live in the U.S. Adam's family's from Israel. Well, I'm Jewish, but my family's Ashkenazi Jews from Mata Russia. Mata Russia. Okay, Mata there you go, Shalom. Ashkenazi Jew from Russia. He grew up in Miami. Family chose to come here. Okay, if in a split second, U.S. all of a sudden came up with shitty ideas and it kept going the way it was, I don't think you have kids. I got four of them. And I know you're a legacy guy because you said that in the first what few What do you minutes. mean a legacy Like you, you want to make an impact. You want to, sure. yeah. So for me, if climate got bad and it was to the point where I'm being forced to do something I don't want to do, I'm either going to run for office, I'm either going to make money to have a platform, I'm going to speak up, I'm going to write a book like you're saying, here's what I believe in and people have to read it and see where it's at. Or I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to go raise my kids in Singapore. I'm going to go to Belize. I'm going to go chill. You know what? Here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to go to XYZ. Uh, uh, I think the world would be a very weird place if we all, 100% of us, believed in the same exact thing. It would be quite boring. So a part of the fact that you're talking about this, you're forcing the rest of us to question our arguments. And we're sitting there saying, well, you know what? He, he seems confident in this. He seems confident in that. Where's the leak in the argument here? So to wrap this part up before we go into current events, Rob, I'm going to pull up this. I'll give you the final thoughts, and then we'll go into current events. So can you pull up what our friends at uh, 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 ChatGBT said oh, about anarchy? It. This is very important. Zoom okay. in because some of us can't. Okay, there you go. Uh, let's put, see the question first because it's important. Michael knows. <laughs> What is the definition of anarchy? Anarchy is a political philosophy or system that advocates for the abolition of government, centralized authority, and uh, hierarchical organization of society. Anarchists believe that individuals should be free to govern themselves and make decisions collectively without the need for ruling class or state apparatus. Anarchy emphasizes the importance of individual freedom, direct democracy, or volunteer association. As opposed to the use of force or coercion, it is important to note that anarchy is not synonymous with chaos or lawlessness, as anarchists often propose alternative forms of social organization and dispute resolution. Right. How do you, you feel? You about like that what definition? he says? Are you, are you okay with that? I am okay with that. I'm just okay. going to make one more point. I don't need 100% of people to agree with me at all. I don't have an opinion on how Macy's should have their refund policy. I understand that this is Macy's. They're not doing it right. They should take a few <laughs> shots of pencil, honestly. Michael, let's like not go that far. I'm not going to go that far. Point being, there's lots of issues. This is the, why I'm against democracy. There's lots of issues where most of us shouldn't have an opinion because it's not our business. Mm -hmm. I, I have one simple question. That Everything you're saying is great. You know, you're saying you know, sort of a low-level conversation, you know, it works. Um, but... We live in on Earth. We all have to live in a country. Sure. And we have to live by which that is a country's recent development, rules. historical development that we live on Earth. No, that everyone is a <laughs> member of one country or another. Okay, got it. But sure. we are in modern times. Sure. So we, I mean, we're not going back to biblical times. Listen. So everything you're saying is great. That's amazing. It, it, you know, relationships, police, everything. I guess what country is closest to even coming close to implementing any of this? Anarcho types of philosophy. Is there any country that even comes close? And, and I'll and I'll ask this question, but I'll strike country so that you don't pick on that. Right. Is there some place or some group or something on earth that comes close? It not just comes close, it is practiced all the time whenever any people 
work together voluntarily towards a common goal. So it's not a location. It's not a certain type of government. Uh, so it's not like you say, um, it's not like you're going to say, well, America has an anarchist government. That's not how it works. Where Whenever if you have peace, freedom, and interrelationships with people on a voluntary basis, that is anarchism being put into practice. And where on earth, whenever anyone uses cuisine, whenever everyone does mathematics, whenever when people use music internationally, all these things, fashion, these are all examples of international, historic, Anarchist Michael, systems. you're driving these guys insane. They want you to give them the country so they can move there. I don't know why you get the hell out of here, Michael, and you just want to fucking play just games. Just name with the my damn heart. country, Michael. Fine, Israel. <laughs> Israel. <laughs> there you go. Israel. All right, let's Are go into current events. Let's, let's go into current events. Let's go into current events. Tom, give us an update on what's going on with Silicon Valley and Credit Suisse, because a bunch of a uh, bunch of stuff came out just yesterday. You, you saw their stock at the beginning. The Dow was down 600, and then it ended up with a couple hundred down. What's going on with the markets right now? Well, speaking of utopia, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, overnight, uh, overnight, it's, it's very interesting. This can be summed up in one chart. Do you have the chart that came from Apollo? So this very interesting chart that comes out assessing the balance sheet risk of the banks. Yeah, can you pop that up a little? And the arrow up there that's uh, toward the left side, is pointing to Silicon Valley Bank. Everything to the right of Silicon Valley Bank is actually more risky and slightly worse holy, off than holy, the Silicon Valley Bank oh my God. balance sheet was. And then if you go all the way to the left, you've got at a score of 15 J.P. Morgan showing strength, prudence, and, you know, probably, you know, the utopia banking experience there because it's risky. So what overnight has happened is that there is the realization that there is a lot of risk at a lot of banks. That's happened overnight. Um, right before the market closed, First Republic, remember they said that was the other bank everybody was concerned about? It has been downgraded and officially given the rating as junk. And Damn. Moody's came out and said, you're not pinning this on us. We're just going to say the whole sector is downgraded. And they downgraded the entire sector to like this questionable status. And so right now, literally, Pat, what we are waiting for, we are waiting for the markets to show us market response to the stocks of the public banks and waiting for the other shoe to drop. Because it's not just New York and it's not just SVP and it's not just First Republic. It's Credit Suisse yesterday morning coming out saying with a stock price of $2.44. So they're down the street from being delisted. I mean, they're not far away. I think it's 90 cents for so many days and something they would be, you know, put on a suspension and then ultimately delisted. So what's going on is there's a huge amount of uncertainty, Pat, and there's big amount of uncertainty that no one can have an opinion on. Can I show you a poll real mm -hmm, fast? Of course. About what is the Fed going to do in the face of all this madness? And I put a poll on Twitter yesterday. So here's 326 votes. Do you think, and I asked a very just sensible, straightforward question, okay? Consumer price index shows inflation's about six, six and a half for the year. Still a problem. And with the SVB collapse, what do you think Jerome Powell will do with interest rates when he announces them next week on the 21st, 22nd? Half a point as expected, twenty a quarter point and be a little more gentle, or zero and then revisit it on May 2nd, which is the next scheduled official meeting of the Fed. Look how close it was. 41% said he's going to, you know, just do a quarter point, and 32% said a half a point, and 26%. For most of the life of the poll, and this is 326 votes, and these are public people, not a bunch of banking industry folks, you know, it, it stayed pretty even, which means everybody actually wasn't very sure. So we're going to find out um, – next week and we're watching and waiting each day along with getting more realization pat that a lot of banks have very weak balance sheets right now and there's a lot of turmoil in the sector but by the way when's the last time uh, moody's downgraded an entire sector the way they just yeah that's crazy banking, right no, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. And banking, that that is what they did yesterday before the market closed. They said, "Okay, we're downgrading the sector." When's the last time? Is that a? Have you heard of that before? Was it like a? Because it's 9/11 wasn't a sector. Like it wasn't like right, we're gonna. Yeah. You know, 9/11 was. So it makes you it makes you think. Yesterday, I'm talking to the folks at Morgan Stanley. I'm like, so what's going on? He says, "Look, you can't raise 450 bibs in 12 months and not expect these banks to go through what they're going through right now." 
So, but here's here's the Completely. question. The question becomes the following. Okay, Janet Yellen, you guys build out those, you know, however many people at Silicon Valley Bank with above a quarter million dollars FDIC. So we're not bailing out uh, 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 Silicon Valley Bank. We're bailing out the uh, depositors is what we're doing. Okay, fine. No problem. Bank's going to fail, going to get sold, but we're helping the people. Okay, no problem. Great. Uh, how many more can you handle? One more? Right. Five it, more? It's dominoes. Ten right? more? Twenty more? Like, you know, you know, I had a, a, a friend of mine. He started making, he, he was a, the top interior designer in Hollywood. Was, he was making 1.6 every year, and I'm his advisor. He's sitting with me. I'm doing a needs analysis. I said, so tell me uh, your expenses. Um, how much you have in savings? I, I got around $500,000. Okay. How much you have in 401k? Zero. How much you have in stocks? Zero. You only have a half a million dollars? Yes. How long have you been making a million and a half? About a decade. <laughs> I said, what's your mortgage payment? Mortgage payment is 15 grand a month. Okay. What's your car payment? I got that SL500, $2,000 a month. What's that? Okay, great. Yeah, where's, the, the, where's the money going? Where's the money going? So watch what he says. He says, I give my mom 10 grand a month. I give my dad 10 grand a month. And my mom asked me to help his sister out, my auntie. I give her eight grand a month. And I give my dad's brother now eight grand a month. He was giving his family $40,000 every month. Oh, my God. You know what ended up happening? Eventually. The government failed? Well, 08 <laughs> happens. Once 08 took place, they're no longer, he's no longer, he goes yeah. from 1.6 to 200 grand a year. Okay. Yeah, there's no more interiors to design. Yeah. So I'm like, point. so what are you doing All now? The houses are done. He's he, the government and he fails. He had to make yeah. four phone calls. What are those four phone calls? To his mom, his dad, the sister, the brother, all that. He was the most hated man in the family. I can't believe you're doing this. I'm 80 years old. I'm da 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 da. Here's the problem you can make one company happy, Silicon Valley Bank. You can make two signature, maybe mm -hmm. three. Dude, you can, if this shit hits the fan and 20 banks smaller than Silicon Valley Bank that secretly are sitting here saying, don't expose us. And on top of that, they have a target of money being pulled out. How much did B of A just get? B of A, the number. $15 billion. $15 billion yeah. in, in Silicon Valley Bank fails. JP Morgan says, claims they got $2, million, $2 billion. How many more banks after seeing something like this are saying, babe, let's take our money out? If this thing goes next level, right. it's going to be a, a scary, scary side. Janet Yellen and Biden can see Noble doing this with these guys. Very soon they're going to have to say no to somebody, and it's going to hurt. And the rich will just get richer with these big banks. You're, they're all just going to go to Wells. See, they're going to go to Citi. They're going to go to Chase. They're going to Bank of America. And the interior, there's going to be four big banks at that point. The interior and, designer should have just made one phone call and then blamed it on that one person. Just It's <laughs> mom's fault that I can't pay the rest of you. It's, no, it's the wife. You got to say, well, honestly, <laughs> yeah. my wife wants to leave yeah, but me Moody's if I do downgrading this. an entire sector. I mean, my brother and sister and I got out of hand. My mom got Moody and downgraded all of us, but I've never seen Moody's downgrade an entire industrial sector. And then, I'm sure then someone's going to be in the super chat and tell us. And by the way, if you know it, put it in the super chat and, and let us and know the, because the, I the, honestly the, don't recall. There's the problem of perception become reality, right? If there's less of a belief that these banks are stable, that's going to encourage more and more people to have a run and then it becomes this kind of yeah, dominant. That's, 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 that's even worse. That's, that's even worse. And that's, that was the run they tried to prevent. You're, you're correct. They tried to they, they wanted to prevent anarchy from happening. And so what they said hey, was, we're the government usually does. We're going to protect, <laughs> we're going to peck the depositors. So please don't run on the banks. Yeah. So it was like they took 25 billion out there to prevent a trillion. That was the, that, yeah, yeah. I, I, I that was the play. Yeah. And then yeah. it just becomes what? A self fulfilling prophecy right. where it's just like, no, this is happening. And then uh, I'm glad my money's in crypto. Yeah, that's worked out well for the last year. Not 100%, but yeah. You, but you but, can't be serious, Michael Malice. What do you You're mean? You're glad your money's in crypto. I am right now. Of course I am. Yeah. Right now? Yeah. What about over the last year where it's gone down 70%? I, I bought low, kept it, I hodled it, then it went down. It's still there. I'm not going to sell it yeah. when it goes down. I will tell you, I will tell you, and I'm not a pro-Bitcoin or an anti-Bitcoin guy. Like, I'm not... Uh, uh, you know, during the entire, hey, can you do a, a sponsorship for FTX? We've never done it because I'm not, uh, that's not my world. Sure. So we've never taken a sponsorship from a lot, any crypto guys, and we've got a lot of uh, requests. Kind of like how you say, I'm not educated enough on the Ukraine to give it, I'm not a crypto guy to say, hey, here's what we're doing with this. But I will tell you this. If I am a Bitcoin guy, your argument right now is getting stronger. Okay. That's why Bitcoin went up 20% in a day. Went from twenty to twenty-four thousand the other day. This is a very good time for the pro Bitcoin folks to be selling 
what they're selling. There is a the only challenge they have right now is the following is uh, my concern's always been we've had Michael Saylor on a few times and we've had a bunch of these guys. My only concern's always been that uh, these guys going to want to regulate. So the whole CBDC, they come out there, try to regulate the crypto community, what that's going to look like. And they're going to use this crisis to say, you know, what if this happens to crypto? What if this happens to this? They're going to figure out a way to regulate that. If they don't, I think Bitcoin's a good place to be if they don't get their hands on it. But again, we'll see what's going to happen there. All the DeFi guys are out there saying, see, told you. Yeah. No, by the way, exactly. Huh? They should. They should. They should say it. This is a time to say your argument. If gold pops, Peter Schiff should come out and say, I told you so. I told you so, right? It should, it should be able to. My big concern is that at some point, maybe you're right that they're going to have to be like, all right, we got to stop the contagion, bail it out, and then you have yeah. to get inflationary as a consequence. That's on top of the inflation that's already happened. And what that ends up screwing over is the poorest of the poor. Uh, so that is really my concern here. I, we're on the same page there. 100%. I, they, they, they're going to want to get their hands on it. So let's talk a little bit about reparations. San Francisco, I'm sure you're a big supporter of this. So San Francisco... To consider $5 million reparation check for black citizens, uh, and it's, it's actually, they're getting pretty close to it, uh, are considering a draft plan for a reparation package that would pay $5 million lump sum payments to eligible black residents in addition to eliminating personal debt and tax burdens and providing guaranteed annual income of at least $97,000 $97, for 250 years to an under, 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 undermined Number of blacks, guys, I'm a little bit flabbergasted. Let me read that one more time. Tax burdens and providing guaranteed annual incomes of at least $97,000 for 250 years. The plan also proposes allowing black families to purchase homes in expensive cities for just a dollar. Critics have slammed the proposal as financially impossible with one estimate suggesting it could, po it could cost the city roughly $50 billion and another suggesting that each non-black family in the city would have to pay at least $600,000 However, proponents argue that $5 million figure is actually low when considering the harm caused to black community. The state of California is also considering some reparations proposal that would cut $360,000 checks for every eligible black citizens. So the state of California, can I point something out? So yesterday I was reading, and it's very interesting. When did California abolish slavery in California? They never had slavery. That's correct. Yeah. That was a trick question. And then I looked back at all the other states that actually had legalized slavery, Massachusetts, Connecticut. It was, it was really shocking. California has never had slavery. So even going back into California history to say, well, at this point, we really feel the state, you know, it was, was not acting and had done this and had these laws. No. So how does the state offer reparations for something that actually historically it never actually did? See, you're thinking 2022. It's 2023. And it's not reparations for slavery. It's reparations for racism. So they're talking about California had like discrimination. Uh, what did they have? Those covenant clauses in a contract. Like if I sold you a house, both Diane Feinstein and Michael Huffington, when they ran against each other for Senate, I think it was in 94, it turned out they had a house that had a clause that says, I will never in perpetuity sell this house to an African-American. And people ignore them, but they're still in the books. So this is paying for all of that. Um, and the point is, it's never going to end. Uh, and the point of reparations, right? Pat, you burn down my house. You give me the value of my house and some cost, you know, suffering. Then it's, I have reparations. I, my, I'm restored back to zero. The point of reparations is once it's resolved, you move on. But it, does anyone seriously think that if this actually happens, that it's like, okay, racism is done and we're going to move on to society and people are going to stop complaining about racism in California? Of course not. I'm in favor of this. Because the faster California gets driven into the ground and the more of a kind of a understanding that, you know, government is just basically a shakedown system, the better it'll be for everyone. But how does it work? Because it's San Francisco, so it's a city. So it's not the state, right? So They'll figure it out. Level. Oh, they'll figure it out. Yeah. That they just tried to ban 3D printers in all of California. For oh, what? Yeah. Because there, the law says, I don't know if they passed it yet, but if any object is used primarily or largely to 3D print guns, it's going to be, uh, uh, they're trying to ban it in California. Can you, can you find that article? Yeah, Go. look up 3D printing guns. Yeah, there it California. is. Yeah. It's right there. I just saw it. Go, mm -hmm. the fourth one. Yeah. California passes new three, uh, uh, that's 26. That's an older one. Yeah, if you can find a newer one. It was just in the last couple of weeks. It's pretty wild to be thinking about this $5 million. So you know what it makes me think about? 
when I was talking to Roland Martin, and Roland uh, said, I grew up in a, this community, and, I, and I'm like, okay. And what happened? I left. Why'd you leave the community? Everybody left. <laughs> I, I don't understand. If you really want to help the community, why are you leaving the community? Well, because everybody else left. So anyways, he'll respond to this on Twitter with some kind of a link and, and file, and, and I like it when he does that because it allows me to go and look up uh, a few other things. But uh, what's going to happen if they can buy expensive homes for a dollar? Okay? So you mean to tell me they can go buy homes, expensive homes, at a dollar, and they're going to get $5 million and ninety seven grand over how many years? It 250? Was? 250 years, man. If they're going to live 250 years, that's respect. Right, if you got that kind of <laughs> but but no no not right? necessarily. If inflation like five years ninety seven thousand is going to be worth like what, a soda. Yeah, but but if you think about that, then here's a perfect case study for people that are going to say, "Well, I can't believe you." If people if they do this, you're actually right. If they do this just to see what happens as a case study, it's a great case study for everybody else. Let's see what happens. I'm actually really curious what happens. Oh yeah, go for it. Do it. Give them the money. Let's move forward. Let's see what happens to San Francisco. Let's see if San Francisco becomes a better city. Let's see if it becomes more vibrant. Let's see if more business owners want to move to San Francisco. If it does, then guess what? We officially have a case study. If it doesn't, you also officially have a case study that it doesn't work. I, I think we maybe have some, I agree with that. And I think we have some mini case studies out there. When you take a look at mega lotto winners and what they do, they effectively allow their relatives to buy a house for a dollar because they just give it to them. And when you take a look at also athletes of all diversities and all backgrounds, you take uh, an athlete that's suddenly given this monstrous contract when they get drafted by the NBA and the NFL. Remember hockey and baseball, you have this rookie contract that goes five years, as you know, Pat. But then you've got the sports where you just walk in the door and you've won the lotto, right? Because you're a one of the top three kids coming out of uh, college, and there you go. And then you buy a house for your mom, and you give a car to your brother, and you give house to your sister. Go take a look at the condition of those assets, and go take a look how they care for them. I'm I, telling you. We I, have mini case. We have little mini yeah. case studies that follow exactly what you're showing. People will not take care of it. I want to see it, though. I'm, I'm, I'm oh, I want to see it. I want to see it. Yes, oh, yeah. America to see, see it and it. say it. This see? thing works. Well, I want to see, see it. We figured it out. Let, let me actually. We put have something unity up. in the house. They, they say right here. Wait, it's can, gonna, can I say gonna, some more thing? Yeah, go ahead. The Chinese were enormously opp uh, oppressed in in California, so they're going to be next on this list. And they've, I would, they have more of a reason historically with chi with California than the African Americans do. So reparations yeah. for them as well. Uh, what, am what, I wrong? What a noble request. Does it not make more sense for them? Sure. Well, there were all these laws. That was my question: Is the slippery slope effective here? Because right here it says, "Why don't you throw Iranians in there?" There you go. Where does <laughs> this, who where does this used end? to live in California and go there for vacation now live in Florida? I think we should figure something out there. Where's your Iran track? Iranians? <laughs> only Americans know about oppression. <laughs> if right, if you watch the corporate press, you and I, our families, we don't know about oppression. No, no, one, no nothing one, happens. No well. one left the elevator when we stepped Very in. Very healthy upbringing, you know. <laughs> it was nice. Yeah. Everyone had a party. Peaceful. Yeah. Adam, just clear your throat, Ro throw loud, and go for it. Rose yeah. water ice cream. <laughs> Well, it's a slippery slope effect. So it says it's going to cost the city roughly $50 billion. So let's say, you know, you're a white guy, you're an Asian guy, you're a Latin guy, whatever. You're, you're a Iranian guy. And you're like, yeah, all right, cool. I agree. Maybe this is something they should do. Let's, you know, make right the sins of our forefathers. All right. So let's say you do agree with this. Okay, great. But sure. by the way, part of this is each non-black family in the city would have to pay at least $600,000. So hold on. So as a white guy, all right, maybe you can make the argument, all right, well, you're not black. You, Your forefathers were maybe the oppressors. All right, it's time for you to pay. All right, well, now the Mexicans got to pay, though. The Asians got to pay. The Native Americans got to pay. Like, where does it end? Like, how do you determine who ends up paying? So if it's only, if, if it's all non-black residents, so now we're all paying. So I, my family just moved here four years ago or 40 years ago from Mexico. I have to pay for some, it's just like, where does this end? Politics isn't about logic or reason. It's about power. Uh, and that is kind of central to anarchist thought. So what you're saying makes logical sense. But again, this isn't even about reparations in the sense of reparations of making people whole. This is simply a, basically a cash grab and a way to kind of get a voting block uh, in place in perpetuity, quite obviously. But, but wow, if, you're go odd. if you're going for a voting block, you already have the vote. It's, it's as liberal city as it gets, San this, Francisco. This also appeals to Karen. Because white 
liberal women love stuff. Am I wrong? Love stuff. Let like me this. tell Fuck you. I'm, Karen. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm telling you right now, Adam, I want to see this happen. Oh, yes. I'm for it as well. This I want to see it happen. And you know who else I want to see duplicate this? New York City. This is. Oh, do it. Baby. I want I want <laughs> San Fran to do it, New York City to do it, Chicago to do it, LA to do it. Do it. Let's see what happens. This is why I donated money to John Fetterman. I want to see, <laughs> I want, and he's my candidate for president. I want to see this happen. The faster the Senate becomes Arkham Asylum, the better it is for everybody. You just want to that's see the country cool. burn. By the way, there's, oh. there's, serious. A, there's a part of it that's funny, but there's a part of it that honestly, for me, uh, uh, we have a relative, and I'll tell you what, this guy was a very prominent figure on TV, okay? Very, in the Persian community. And at the tail end of his career, he had a stroke. And the family was okay with people coming and visiting him. And there's no way he would ever want people to come and see him in a condition like that. It was horrible, if you know what I'm talking about. And the son was not okay with this. Like, this is not cool for this to be happening. I'm totally, I can't say anything. I'm a nobody in the family to say, hey, guys, what are you doing here? Right. They have to make the decision. If something like that happened to you and I, and if my wife put me in the public, I would be... I'd be waiting for her in heaven for her to show up and say, what were you thinking? Allow me to be in public. F Fetterman's family and Democrats to just put him up front like that to say, well, he's great. He's this. He's that. That's a form of abuse, what they did to that guy. The, he could acquit at any time. You're removing agency from him. He has aphasia. He's not literally like Terry Schiavo brain dead. Yeah. And this guy's entire life has been seeking political power. This is the monkey's paw, right? It's like you have a genie's wish. It's like, I wish I was sent here. It's like, all right, but it's going to cost you. He's like, I don't care. And now I'm hoping for the day when some uh, on the Senate floor, when his head just explodes and covers 99 other senators with brain parts, blood and skull bits. You would want to see that. Oh, desperately. Well, you are an anarchist. There you go. You just... I'm an American. Yeah. Like wow. Every American yeah. worth his salt wants to see a senator's head, just like JFK, head explode out of nowhere. You just took it to a whole different level. Oh, your different your different game level. just went to a whole different level. Okay, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about something yeah. else. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about a little bit of a, I don't know if you heard of this guy. Um, they both live in uh, from this one state called Florida. One guy's name is Ron. The other one's Donald. I don't know if you follow him. This I, very I've, closely I, yes, I know. Okay. The, yes. And they're Don both and Ron. very competitive. Don, yes. Very competitive. So CNN The poll. most competitive. No one's ever been this yeah, competitive. Not at all. Most competitive. I don't say it. Other people do. Okay. So CNN poll, Michael. So obviously these guys know what they're talking about. So CNN poll, uh, most Republicans care more about picking a 2024 GOP nominee who agrees with them on issues than one who can beat Biden. Okay. So this poll shows that only 30% of Republicans and Republican-leaning independents believe that the country's best days are still ahead of it. This represents a significant shift from 2019 when 77% of Republicans were optimistic. When asked about the 2024 GOP nomination, 59% of Republicans prioritize a candidate who agrees with their views on major issues over one who has strong chance of beating President Biden. The poll also shows that 38% of Republicans view increasing uh, racial, ethnic, and national diversity as a threat, which is twice as high as four years ago. Additionally, 78% believe that society's values on sexual orientation and gender identity are changing for the worse. And 79% think that the government is trying to do too many things that should be left to individuals and businesses. What do you think about this? I think the reasons people give for why they vote the way they do are almost never the actual reasons, right? No one says, I voted for the better looking person, I voted for the taller person, but they're going to have a rationalization after the fact that like, oh, I like him more for the issues or I like his career. Kind of like the Kennedy thing you were talking right, about. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I think when people are asked what you're looking for, it's not necessarily what they're actually going to do in the voting booth, number one. Number two is, uh, I don't think Trump has a very good shot uh, pun intended, because as soon as they start talking about the Fauci stuff, especially with the base, uh, as soon as you start talking about his staffing decisions, uh, it's going to look pretty bad for him. Um, and I also think that there is enough in, um, impetus on the Democratic side for him to be either kind of uh, um, charged with some kind of crimes, because I think they're very— You think so? If I'm an attorney general— and I have the possibility of prosecuting a former president, that's going to catapult me, a state attorney general, into some national fame and, and history books. So the incentives are very much there for uh, uh, you know, Democratic uh, Party operatives to push him as far as they can. Why wouldn't they? Now, when you say you don't think he's got a shot, uh, uh, 
define that, meaning I he has a great shot of winning the Republican primary. No, I don't, don't think agree? he has. I think he's general gonna, election might. No, I don't might, think he has a good shot at the primary. How could you possibly I'll, say I'll that he's sixty percent in the CPAC? He's going to tell you if you don't stop interrupting. Stop interrupting me, Michael Malice. Well, CPAC is irrelevant, as as you know, because if you last CPAC what it was at this point in twenty uh, um, sixteen, I don't think Trump's name was even there, uh, or maybe he was because he just spoke in number one. Number two is he's going to have an issue with fundraising because now the it's he's become so radioactive that if I'm a big businessman and I'm giving him money, it's going to be a problem for me and my customers because all the press is going to be on top of it. Uh, there's going to be enormous uh, amount of, there's a space now, if I am Facebook or am I some, or CNN or Fox, for me to say no to his ads because now it's been established that this guy fomented insurrection. I don't believe that's true at all, but that is the argument. So it's easy for me as a corporation mm -hmm. who's going to be almost always left of center to be like, oh, I can't take your money because you're not a patriot, so on and so forth. So he has a lot more stack against him now than he did even in 2016. So let me go to a story. Let me go to a story, and then you guys can continue with this. So maybe there is uh, some an event that could take place that could help him out. Here's what it is. Donald Trump's Truth Social cuts staff as his SPAC languishes. This is a Bloomberg story. Trump, and, Trump Media and Technology Group, the parent company of Truth Social, has laid off about half a dozen people including senior members of its ranks, such as the chief technology officer, which, by the way, that's in the technology company. Yeah. That's like number one yeah. above everybody else. William B.J. Lawson. It's like you wake up in the morning and fire your own heart. That's, that's <laughs> top right there. Yeah. <laughs> The, the company done. Is, yeah, the company is. That's actually a good joke, Tom. That's, I like that's, that. see, that's two in a row. Okay, so the company <laughs> estimates it can it can fund operations through September at present spending levels. Trump media executives were once optimistic about the advertising revenue Truth Social could generate, but the reality of launching an advertising business has proved more complicated. Truth Social monthly web and desktop visits reached a high of eleven and a half million in, uh, in visitors in August, uh, twenty twenty two, but I've seen a decline. Holy moly! This is a real number, to 5.7 million in February. So 11.5 million to 5.7 is a little over 50%. It's 51%. So here's what I think, and I want to get your thoughts, and you guys can talk about this. This could help him out. Why? Here's why. How long has he been free to post on Facebook, Twitter, for a while, Instagram, yes. right? But he hasn't, okay? Why? He's trying to drive value to Truth Social, SPAC, money, all these people, your friends. They put up money. Here's $5 million, Here's $10 million, Here's $50 million, Whatever the number is, right? You're raising it. SPAC is a very, very risky thing. And it's probably the worst time ever that they had a SPAC. Possibly the worst time ever when they did the SPAC at the tail end of a peak of SPACs. When all these guys were doing SPAC, SPAC, SPACs, we almost did a SPAC time for $400 million. You remember that? Last minute we had a meeting. We decided we're not doing it. By the way, we were like all the way in to decision on a Zoom, nope, we're moving on. We didn't do it. Very Make a fast point for those of you listening. Yeah. It was a profitable company that had been profitable for many years. Yeah, or so EBITDA we was a not, solid we, EBITDA. Yeah, we weren't trying to go out and be no, a public no, no. company just yeah. because we were a profitable company. And we wanted we decided, to go out. And, we yeah. wanted to go, and even we decided no. Everybody we called, they said, if you would have done it five years ago, yes, this is the worst time to do a spec. So if truth goes under, now he's not fully committed to post the stuff on Truth, so he's going to be active on what? Twitter, Facebook. So maybe Truth Social going out of business could actually help his campaign. I what agree completely because the reason people like Trump and what I like the most about him is because both his foes and his friends every morning would wake up and be like, what is this asshole tweeting about now? <laughs> right? Like I, I could – the fact that when you had the Democrats go into a military base overseas and he pulled their permission slips and they just circle the bus around and they kind of get off the bus, that was the funniest shit ever. So him on Twitter was what got him the presidency. It was integral to uh, yeah. him getting the nomination and getting the presidency and it would behoove his campaign to have him back on it despite all the people who were like take the, his phone away from him that said he hasn't been on fox since in months uh the, the all like the vast the like, conservative estab media establishment has turned their backs on him and he's not like fresh like he was in 2015 where no one's seen anything like him before i think it's gonna be very hard for him to regain that fire that he had now almost a decade ago i can't believe you guys think this is actually would be a good look for him I, I hear where you're coming from because if you want to win a national election, you're going to want to be on all the major social media yeah. platforms. You're going to want to be on Twitter. You're going to be on you Facebook. Have to. You have megaphone. to. National megaphone. You have yeah, to. Yeah. But there's a reason. There's a reason he's not using it right now because he's doubling down on his SPAC Truth Social. I would argue that the worst thing to ever happen to Donald Trump on a social media situation is Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Okay, because Elon Musk 
has basically enabled Twitter to be a free speech platform. That was the whole point of Truth Social. So the whole marketing agenda was like, this is a, a free speech platform. Come join us. This is where it is. All it has turned out to be is a right-wing echo chamber. I don't know any moderate or even liberal that's even going close. Or even conservative to truth who's social. just not MAGA. Look at Tom just pointed at himself. He's like, I, I don't go there. So the last thing that Donald Trump, I mean, Donald Trump's got, you might, some may argue that he's got thin skin. Some may argue in order to make it to where he's at, he has sure. to have thick skin. We don't know what exact type of skin he has. It's orange. Right? It's orange. We know that. But the last thing that he wants to be labeled is a loser. But he okay, and you're about to say that he is a loser. I would argue, you know, he's won a bunch more than he's lost, but lately he's been losing. But I don't think this is a good look for his brand. So what's his brand? Whether it's Trump hotels, yeah. Trump casinos, Trump steaks, Trump waters. A lot of these businesses have failed. So now you're telling me the one business. Michael, the one business you've been working on since you lost the election, Truth Social, is now going to fail. Tell me that how that empowers him to be the president of the United States again. Well, I, I don't see it. I don't think Truth Central, as he called it, Truth Central, is going to be uh, central to his brand or his identity. I think he's riding on, I was the former president, I'm the one who could take on Biden, I had results in the past, I'm going to have results in the future. What MAGA people don't appreciate is that his last year in the White House, he took L after L after L after L. It was an entire year of L's. It wasn't, and the fact that if you, even if you regard the election as having been stolen, the fact that they were able to drag this carcass across the finish line, mm -hmm. how if he ha couldn't stop that in 2020 with the power of the White House behind him, mm -hmm. how is he going to stop that in 2024 with the power of the White House against him? Now you could argue that whoever they put up, they're going to take it. He, he doesn't have a chance. Th that's a I, okay. I can wrap my head around that argument, but that's not a good argument for Trump specifically, as opposed to someone who's yeah. won. Or but one could also won. argue without COVID. Trump Trump would have beat Biden pretty but fairly. If, but I think a lot of these MAGA people think that no matter what happened, it would have been stolen from him. Yeah, well, we've seen what's happened with the Fox lawsuit with sure. Dominion. And yeah, I'm just saying that's there. I'm, I'm yeah, not saying that's if you're fake. trying to talk to some supporters, that's, yeah. their, that's where they are. But right? So I guess as an odds perspective, I love coming and getting the odds. Like this wouldn't 100% hurt him. It wouldn't 100% enable him. Like. No. Give me the, the odds of why you think this would be good versus bad. I think this would be a bad look for his yes, truth look, social spec to fail. I think you were talking about two different things. You're talking about it would be an L on his business legacy and bother his ego. I think Pat was talking about something else. Yeah. I think both of you, Michael, respectfully, are very naive. Okay. And you have to accept it, that you're very naive. And utopian. Here's why. <laughs> let, me, let me explain to you why. Here we go. Okay, here, here's why. Here's why. So let's just say if... You were best friends, and we've known each other from high school, okay? We always hung out. We got along. We've been tight forever. We have each other's back, okay? We're now, you know, you go through your first divorce after being married for seven years, and we get the call. Hey, guys, you guys got a minute? Yeah, what's up? I got to talk to you guys. What's that? Mary and I are going through a divorce. Oh, shit. Sorry, bro. What's 40 grand a month? Yeah. yeah so <laughs> kids, this, that. No, man, it's just reached a point. It's just not going to work out. We're going through a divorce. Trust me. I'm kind of dealing with it. You guys mind if we meet up somewhere tonight? Yeah, no, no problem. Let's go. We'll go meet up. Okay. <laughs> so we feel bad for you. You, six months later, you meet Jackie. And you're, hey, it's Jackie. Da, da, da. Oh, it's, oh, good to meet you, Jackie. Everything good? Yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. It was tough for about three months, but Jackie and I met, you know, on Bumble. And, you know, it was a phenomenal. I'm like, oh, we're happy for you, man. Everything good, Michael? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One sentence. My friend Jackie is currently in the hospital, and she's so caring. She called the cops on the nurses two days ago. So shout out to Jackie. You're joking. No, I'm not. You want me to change your name? <laughs> no, no. To not it's make it's you funnier. feel uncomfortable? It's funny. I okay, love her. She's so a great woman. So let's go with Jackie. <laughs> so you're dating Jackie, <laughs> and you're happy, and then all of a sudden we come to your second wedding. Okay. And you're up there. You know, you're doing what you're doing. Me, Tom, and Adam walk to the side, and we're having a drink, and we say, okay, guys, over under. What are the chances of this one working out? <laughs> Adam says, I don't know, bro. I think it's 10%. Tom says, no, this one's going to work out. Yeah, he loves her and 80%. I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm kind of like at 30% mark. Okay, cool. All right, sounds good. This one, nine months later, you give us a call. And you say, dude, this, this chick's crazy. She's a Karen. She's this. She's in a hospital. This is not going to work out, right? So what are you doing? I'm getting a divorce ASAP. It's just not going to work out. Great, no problem. The third time you call us for the wedding, our schedule is probably busy. Okay? What's the point here? Like, ah, he's getting married again. Leave it alone. It's I'm fine. not inviting you. You never believed in me. <laughs> <laughs> we were friends since high school, and you're taking bets at my wedding? <laughs> Fuck you. 
Go, so, back to Ron, go back to Ron with that shit. Fuck out of here. Right dude, that was side. high school. Jackie was a good woman. <laughs> that was high school, you know, dude. You, you, now you go through women every time the clocks change. Cut. Come on. So, so for those of you guys that are upset saying, <laughs> Pat, get to the point. Here's the point. The point is, <laughs> how many stories are there with stakes, with this, with that? No one gives a shit about Truth Social going out of business. Nobody does. This is not the first divorce. Let me make my point, and please don't interrupt. Okay, this is not the first, <laughs> second, or third. I think, statistically, it'll take us a week, two weeks to get over it. They'll take shots. But what are you going to say? He's filed this many bankruptcies, never worked. He's done that, never worked. This guy's going to be able to get more eyeballs if this thing goes out of business. He goes on Twitter. His first tweet, Michael, if it's the right tweet, it'll be the most liked tweet of all time, ever. Ever, ever And ever. he can create momentum if he gets back there. And quite frankly... Guess what? Uh, uh, Elon Musk is not in the business of running nonprofits. Okay, sure. And he <laughs> joked the other day, saying, "I'm officially running the biggest nonprofit of all time because right. they're not making any money. The revenues are down some ludicrous, crazy number that's down." He's going to sit there and say, "Dude, we kind of need the profits. We'll take memberships from Republicans, from MAGA, sure, from whoever sure. it is, even from anarchists. Come and buy membership. We don't care who you are." I think Truth Social going out of business is going to help his campaign. I, Go ahead. I, I, you're saying two contradictory things. Yeah. So it will help his campaign in the long term, but in the short term, it is going to be a problem, and this is going to be an albatross around totally his neck. Yeah. And it's different from the, the uh, um, bankruptcies in the past. No one cares about Trump's stakes. That happened in, what, the 80s or 90s, wherever it was. Point is, this was their mothership. This is where they went to. Yep. And now it closed down. They get kicked out of their house. They're not going to like it because people make friends on social media. You know what I mean? It, it, so it's, it's, it's going to be – and the thing is – Yes, it doesn't really matter because it's not that big of a deal, but they're going to make it matter because even Fox is going to 24 7 be like, Correct. look, another disaster from Trump. Correct. The TDS is going to be everywhere. And I think one thing you got to, uh, everything comes down to sort of the news cycle. If this yes. does fail, it'd be better to fail sooner rather than later. And I think his spin is going to make it worse because he's not going to say, all right, we tried our best and it didn't work out. He's going to have some cockamamie excuse. And that's what they're going to. The left leaning uh, Democrats didn't want this to happen. They wanted to see me fail. The only, exactly. By the way, the only, the only recommendation I would give is I would give the strategist that are working closely with President Trump to. Have him realize there's a different approach you have to take as the favorite than as the, as yes. the what do you call it, as the underdog. He's using the, the same strategy yeah. as an underdog in 2015. You're, you, it's not going to work. You have to take a very different approach as a favorite because he's coming across as a bully to DeSantis right now. And it's, it's, a, it's not attractive. Yeah, to but this people. goes back to what I always say. He's not going to change. Like everything he's done. When have we, when have we ever seen him change? Here's what happened. Should he change? Should he take some counsel? Of course. I, we could solve this problem in one not, sentence. Michael, Let's you're the. It. Solve it. All uh -huh. he has to do is sell Truth Social to Kanye West. And the problem is solved. Yeah, because everything he's done with <laughs> Kanye, Kanye West has worked out really well. Or yeah, exactly. Like that, yeah, like that happened, like that, yeah. Right? All okay, his so, arrangements with Kanye but, but, but have worked out well. Let's go to the him. next one. Let's yeah, go to the next one. For us. So, yeah. th this one is specifically for you, and I okay. need I need your insight. Yes, sir. You'll I need, have. You I need shall your have it. On this one, so Even though I should be in bed. Yes, I will. Here we go. By the way, Rob, can we send? What kind of mattress do you have? I have I have a um, I have a sponsor that's a mattress company. And oh, so you, really you got to be committed to them. I am. Mattress. I like have, it. Okay, all right. I was but I need a twin, a new twin. I can use a new Do twin. you really? Yeah, I have a guest room. Uh, do, do you, you need a twin? And I'm trying to make it haunted. <laughs> no joke. So you want like the? You got a girl. You don't. Know, you got to stay. It's a guest room. What do you mean with the girl? Know, the girl's not in the guest room. You just said he's got sometimes twins. Sometimes when you're done, room. you say go in the guest room. No, no. I guess I go in the Uber. I'm thinking like you're high. You're anarchist. Like the wife sleeps in a different room. You're not thinking like like. You don't bring you don't bring the girl over the house if you're married. Are you crazy? That's oh, that's the mistress comment you made at the end. I got you. I'm yes, following you. I'm following on. you closely. Michael, my apologies. Jackie's a big fan of the show. My apologies. This is why after nine months my, it's over because of you, Pat. I apologize. Please receive She's, oh, she's okay. blowing up my phone right now. All right, here we go. She's here waiting we go. for the cops to show I up I need your insight on this one, Mr. Michael Malice. Yes, Republicans sir. knock Ron DeSantis after Florida governor says helping Ukraine is not a vital U.S. interest. Several high-profile Republicans, including Senator Marco Rubio, Nikki Haley, Liz Cheney, and uh, uh, Lindsey Graham, are pushing back against Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' argument that helping Ukraine fend off Russia's invading forces isn't a vital inter national interest. In a questionnaire sent by Fox News host Tucker Carlson, DeSantis declared that becoming further entangled, that's a uh, uh, Jada Pinkett uh, word, yeah, that's in a reference. territorial dispute between Ukraine and Russia, is not of vital interest to the U.S. and criticized the Biden administration for Ukraine, funding Ukraine. Rubio argued that Russia's end goal is to overthrow the Ukrainian government 
and rule the country. And he said the war should not be compared to other conflicts or territorial disputes settled with treaties or peace agreements. Haley accused DeSantis of copying former President Donald Trump's stance on Ukraine and Ch- uh, Cheney accused DeSantis of weakness and forgetting the lessons of Ronald Reagan. Graham tweeted that allowing Russia to succeed in con- uh, conquering Ukraine invites aggression by China and Taiwan. Thoughts? I have a hashtag called Limbs for Liz, where people who lost their arms and legs in military service can send the prosthetics to Liz Cheney's house because there's not enough corpses and dismembered people for her taste. She needs a second house. She needs a second condo. This woman is pure evil. And frankly, I, my understanding is that she was the model for Miss Piggy. If you put a picture of them side by side, you can't see the difference. Um, I don't. I think what DeSantis is doing wow. is he's running for the nomination. And I don't think Nikki Haley, Liz Cheney, and Lindsey Graham between them, see, that's identical. Uh, if you the, oh my. have have any? Am I wrong? So funny. That's offensive, Michael. It's f- oh, why? Because it's haram. <laughs> um, I don't think between the three of them they have any kind of clout with the Republican base. I think the Republican base has become increasingly radicalized. And I think a year from now, when you're in New Hampshire and Iowa, to still be supporting pumping more money to Ukraine is going to be extremely unpopular with the Republican base, whether that's a good thing or not. Adam. Yeah, I think what we're getting is a little insight into Ron DeSantis' uh, mindset. Yeah. If if he were to run on a uh, for presidency, which we all expect him to do, he's it could be as early as May. I think is when after the Florida um, government yeah. situation yeah. kind of um, dissipates. But he he's sort of cueing to the base. Hey, this is where I stand on this, and he's drawing a strong delineation between what Biden stands for, which is obviously doubling down on Ukraine he sent tripling quadrupling yeah. all that he sent every one of uh, you know who was the latest person that he sent over to Ukraine it was uh he sent Janet Yellen and okay. then he sent um Merrick Garland I believe to Ukraine basically he's doubling down on Ukraine he's basically saying this is the difference between me and Joe Biden and in the if that is who ends up running against if he does get the nomination he's sort of giving uh, a heads up this is where I stand and here's why it's, this is smart because the big whispering campaign coming out of Trump and MAGA world is that DeSantis is a closet neocon when he was in Congress he's basically another you know uh, um, uh, George W. Bush and there's a big concern that he's a wolf in sheep's clothing and that once he gets into office he's just going to be a product of the uh, military industrial complex and just push for war something that Trump uh, from their perspective did not Mm-hmm. do so this is a great way for him to get ahead of that criticism and be like yeah. i know you're worried that i'm another war hawk like you get year after year with republicans but i'm really different and i'm not going to be like what you're fearing i'm going to be mm-hmm. i think i agree with that to a certain extent it's really early and that's what i every time i see these things here i just bang it around in my head it's just like okay next it's really early it, you know it, nikki haley has her motivations Clearly, Lindsey Graham and Liz Cheney, you know, they've got their motivations. And I Mm -hmm. think also the classic technique, you know, of whenever you have somebody emerging is to start picking at them. Mitt Romney didn't have the entire Republican Party behind him when he was emerging. People were picking at him. I think, you know, it's power brokering. It's it's. People like Nikki Haley, she's competing with them. She's a competitor. Just call it. She's competing for the Republican nomination. So she's a hard-nosed competitor. So we're not surprised about her. Yeah. Check. And everybody else has got their um, has got their motivations. And he is the emerging front runner. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people are trying to shift the power where they want it to be. You, you know, you know, one of the things that uh, I think you is a is a sign of a guy that's got the chances of winning. Is you have to take a hard position yeah. and get a ton of backlash and still stand firm. And then the market says, wow, mm-hmm. good for him. And then the argument creates momentum, kind of like what you're doing, right? So think about like your argument of, no, let me tell you, here's an, no, 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 no. So the, uh, okay, well, maybe he's got a point. Now you got to have your tipping point for that argument to really go. Right. But I think, I think DeSantis has to take this position. Um, I think it favors him. Now, whether people right like it or not, it is what it is. There's a lot of people right now that are kind of sitting there that were all pro-Ukraine. Let's help these guys out. Change the flag colors on my Twitter profile. Now it's like, I don't know about all this money that we're spending. 
and were experienced in America. So I think it could help them out position wise. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure the level of credibility with the other guys. You you don't want to be the group of 18 people that agree disagree with the one guy, right? Because you're you're at a market differentiate. Like why why am I buying RC Cola? Because I'm cheaper. There's got to be something. Well, RC yeah. Cola is also better though. Okay, yeah. there's got to be something. I'm a Dr Pepper guy. There's got to be something that distinguishes me from the it's other disgusting. from from the <laughs> from the other brands. Uh, um, and I think it's um, I think for the this. For the most, this is the most extreme time in our lifetime where there is a disconnect between a party and its base, specifically between the Republican Party and the Republican uh, um, base. I don't think we've ever seen anything like it, the animus that the Republican base has towards the Republican Party. Can I say I, one more thing about this? Uh, do that, and then I want to go to this okay, next story. Just real I, quick, because they keep using the word of national interest. This is not, uh, DeSantis says specifically, this is, helping Ukraine does not fend off... Um, evading forces isn't of national interest. One could argue, yes, this is not of national interest, but this is of our international interest, right? So obviously NATO is an international alliance that that is there to protect uh, typically Europe uh, specifically uh, against Russia's invasion. And one could argue that, all right, if we allow this to happen, what's next? What's the slippery slope that happens with Poland or Finland? And we've seen that Finland and Norway or whoever it is just recently been introduced to, to NATO. Um, and then then you who you have here is uh, Lindsey Graham even tweeting that allowing Russia to succeed in conquering Ukraine, speaking of a slippery slope, now invites China to invade Taiwan. So where does it end if U.S. doesn't draw the line? On these types of situations, but then where does it end? Because at a certain point, then China is going to even more so be on Russia's side. So if you want to play brinksmanship, it's not going to be like the good guys always win. If you're assuming that we're the good guys, as we just demonstrated in Afghanistan. Yeah, well, no, I, I completely understand yeah. on that. But so, but at the end of the day, one can say that this is what I said a couple uh, weeks ago. I think this is a vital U.S. interest to stand pat on what we believe in democracy. You can't just invade countries. I think that's something that we should, whether it's soft power, hard power, throwing money on it, that we should stand behind. Are you willing to send troops? This is my, no, not, not, not whatsoever. The one that you could always argue is how much money? How much money can we be spending? Is it Where do we draw the line on that? Right now we're at $100 billion. Are we willing to commit another $100 billion? How about a trillion dollars? We spent what a trillion dollars in Afghanistan, if not more. We spent four trillion fucking dollars in Iraq. So one could argue, hey, the money just doesn't at make sense whatsoever. But standing firm on on what we believe in, I think is there, there's no amount of money that we can put behind that. Would you regard it as somehow wrong if Putin started targeting American uh, sources resources, like if he started bombing American bases? Well, now he in just somewhere. Would you regard that as somehow illegitimate? What do you mean by illegitimate? Was Meaning that, like, okay. It, not is that an like, act of war? Then yes. But the point being like, would you be surprised? At a certain point, if you're going to keep funding his opponent, we start becoming parties to this war ourselves. No question about yeah. it. Yeah. So you're playing a very dangerous game where you, you. It's, all, it's easy to be like, we're the good guys, we're for democracy, you're not going to do it, but we're not going to send troops. Yeah. At a certain point, he's like, fuck you. Yeah, and but that's th- going to be very. That's something I'm terrified of. Totally understand, and that's a great argument. But at the other, the other end of the uh, of the spectrum is, all right, do we just allow Putin to do whatever he wants with no consequences, and we don't step up? We're America. I mean, like, the world goes as America sort of goes. Like, if we don't step up, if we don't lead, who leads then? China, Russia. Iran, I, I don't, like we need to stand for something here. I, I hear what you're saying, but at a certain point, our the problem, the Thatcher very famously said, the problem with socialism is eventually run out of other people's money. We have limited resources. And this idea that we can fund wars everywhere across the world in perpetuity, wherever so-called democracy is threatened, I think flies, that is the utopian perspective. And at a certain point, we have to be like, all right, this sucks. We're like North Korea is a great example, you know, Mm-hmm. If, if I had my druthers and talk about utopian, if I had a magic wand, I would liberate the North Korean people. We can't do that because their military and, and, and so on and many other uh, uh, China has their backing. So, yes, I like the idea of protecting liberalism in whatever form it takes throughout the world. But at a certain point, we're making ourselves the targets and we're going to have other 9-11s. Yeah, I agree. And that's essentially my point is that what amount of money are we willing to commit to this? I don't th- I think speeches, soft power, saying what we believe in, that doesn't cost anything. And I think that's what we should be doing. And I think it's fully in our right to argue, hey, this is, sure. where else could this money be used? I, I, I think that we need to stand for what we believe in and not invading sovereign nations, I think is sort of tantamount but to what democracy. Is, but what does stand for what we believe in mean? That can mean anything up to boots on the ground. 
if if I'm not sending troops, am I really standing for what I believe in? If I'm not, you know, putting lives in risk, or I'm just talking out of my ass at that point, right? You're saying that you have to send troops or send. If artillery I really want to order- stand for what I believe in, then I, then there's no price too high. The, the heavens fall. I are, have- are you going to to the speech he gave about the you, Americans uh, will need to send their sons and daughters? No, I'm just going to his Zelensky. point that, like, look, listen, if there's if we have to stand up for what we let, let's make Putin, it makes, makes it even easier. If it's like Putin's like a Hitler figure, like, like really just pure evil, and, and the Ukrainians are Which all he's angels. Not, and that's part he's of the not. problem. No, but the point is, are like, kind of labeling him that. Which are we, not. Are, are you comfortable always allocating, no matter how many resources we have, to always fighting dictators? And at a certain point, the answer is we can't. We, at a certain point, we're going to run out of military. We're going to run out of weaponry. We're going to run out of people's patience, too. And that's I, the big problem. I agree with you. I'm yeah. saying that I'm not I, saying we're, we're, we're No, I, I know. But the, money shouldn't be the only situation that we're looking at. I agree. We can't just go down the rabbit hole of another Afghanistan of trillions in, right. in Iraq. Let's go to the next story. Let's go to the next story. DeSantis administration revokes Hyatt Regency Miami alcohol license after it hosted a drag queen Christmas. This is an insider story. The DeSantis administration is revoking their license. Uh, after the party with minors present in the audience. The state's business department accused the Miami venue of several violations, including a prohibition, uh, pro- prohibition of, uh, uh, how do you pronounce that word? Les, les vicious? Les vicious? Lascivious. Lascivious. Uh, what, is, what does that even <laughs> Thank mean? Thank you, sexual. Se- Okay, uh, sexual exhibition before people younger than 16. The department said performers were wearing sexually suggesting clothing and prosthetic female genitalia as well as simulating masturbation, governor, Republican Governor DeSantis of Florida supported the license revocation, revocation, and his press secretary said that sexually explicit content is not appropriate to display to children and doing so violates Florida law. Equality Florida and uh, LGBTQ rights organization said that DeSantis was selectively weaponizing state agencies against businesses to target drag performances, saying such decisions should be left to the parents. Yeah, so uh, the corporate press won't discuss what the content of these shows are. It's literally uh, uh, two uh, male dancers in their like Speedos humping each other on stage. And it's, if you look up Jimbo Tits in a Box, Jimbo's one of these queens. I'm a big fan because drag is transgressive and it's good art for adults, but he's performing with the song is literally called Tits in a Box with dancing around with his big tits in a box and there's kids there who are like five, six, or seven and one the queens was the queens were addressing the children in the audience as well. So yeah, if you look at this, this is not appropriate for children, but it's perfectly appropriate as adult risque entertainment. No doubt, but here's my question. Five, six, seven year olds aren't just getting in an Uber and showing up by themselves. It's the white Why liberal, are the it's parents the white liberal taking moms. them there? Because white liberal moms want to show their dad how trans, how progressive they are, and they, they put a man in makeup and they think yeah. it's the second coming. So then here's the question. This is not appropriate for children, although it's a hilarious but song. Isn't it the parents' decision as to what's appropriate for their kids or not? Yeah, I would never take my any of my kids, my nephew, any of my to anything like this. But if Karen wants to take her daughter to this event, that's her decision. Why would the government step in and tell you what you can and do can't do with your would children? You That's sort of with antithetical to what we're what we stand Rob, for. Rob, honestly, no? you can stop it. It's it's totally. Yeah, familiar. Robert, you're getting a little excited. Would you that. be fine with Karen taking her kids to a bar or to a dispensary? Well, being you you can't be under twenty one. Right to be that, in a bar, but that's what he that's what DeSantis is trying to do. He's saying you can't be under. I think it was eighteen to a show like this. I don't. Know, I thought the whole premise of the Republican Party was limited government and being able to do what you want to do. Again, I'm not defending this no, whatsoever. That's a, I think it's that's fucking a, absurd. That's a, the Republican but isn't Party's it the parent, that. Isn't it the... Well, it used to be. No, it never but was. But isn't... I don't know about of that. limited I government. You can yeah. call 21 for alcohol and, and, and things like that. I don't think you can yeah, call right, that's a non sequitur too, limited right? Limited government. Yeah. You're right, but I don't think that one really applies here. You're telling me that the Republicans don't stand for limited no, government they say and, they do. and getting out of your, Adam, how to get out of your life in your bedroom. Like that. No, they so don't. They don't. No, they don't. But but that, that was the whole premise. No, 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 no. But st- but they st- don't. What are they? No, where am I, I getting that? Keep keep going where you're going. Stay stay on yeah. the arm because that is the argument. The argument of some people on the left will be isn't the right the freedom of speech and not censorship. Why are they censoring this? Your argument mm-hmm. is. Well, this is an aid. Same thing with a dispensary. Can a, a Karen take uh, their kid to a dispensary and buy? So, 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 are you saying 
Is there a law for age right now where this is illegal? Was there a law broken for this? No, I, I'm not familiar with exactly this yeah, can specific Can you find case. out if a law my, was my, broken? My point being, it is not at all crazy to me that there are mechanisms in place where children are not exposed to sexually explicit material. Yeah. I, I think well, there's a lot of historical precedent so and a cultural precedent. They used the phrase violation and they were stating an age. So I assume that the DeSantis administration was acting on something that was precedent, I'm assuming. Go, go back up. The, the business has 21 days what? Go back up? All the way up? Yeah, the business has 21 days to request a hearing. Uh, Beth, a spokeswoman for the department, told Insider, American General, 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 General uh, Hotel Liquor License still in effect, and said that the hotel was reviewing the complaint. Third-party operator manages the Knight Center's uh, programming and ticketing while the hotel— A third-party operator manages the Knight Center's programming— and ticketing while the hotel provides food and beverages concessions. Republican governor said widely considered to be an amounting presidential. Sexual Yeah, what I want to know is what law was broken, okay? Mm -hmm. Because these are two different conversations. What law was I broken? I think it's more like if you're going to be serving alcohol, because he took the liquor license. He didn't put anyone in jail. So I think the premise is if you're going to have a liquor license establishment, you're not allowed to have underage people. But that's not true, though, because when I go to Armenian weddings, trust me, there's a lot of liquor. And there's plenty of kids around. But maybe those laws their... aren't being enforced in, in, in those situations. Okay. But one more to your point. Yeah. Uh, we could all wrap our heads around kids not being able to go to strip clubs or to Chippendales, right? doesn't mean they shouldn't exist. They should be banned. So I think this is just kind of more of the same, but in a gay context. Yeah. And again, I'm not, I would never take my nephew to anything like this. That's not for me. But I'm just giving the counter argument where it's like, okay, what's acceptable and not? So if you go back to that video, it's like, where do you draw the line? Like, let's say kids want to go see a clown or you want to go see a magician. R read right? Go back up. Go back up. The, the t First Amendment. Yeah, right. The fundamental tenet of First Amendment is that the government should not punish people simply because it disapproves of the content of their speech. Yet the decision will harm a business simply because it supported speech of government, speech the government doesn't like. Right. That's Legislation for Republican Assembly, including Florida, has targeted drag performances with you know, this year, Tennessee becomes the first to ban adult performances, including drag. Okay, but that's where I'm going with it. Mm -hmm. Where I'm going with it is the following. Here's where I'm going with it. Great. If you want to take the license away, rather than taking the license away, do what Tennessee does. Ban adult performances, including drag, from public spaces such as parks and schools. If you want to do that with kids being present, make that a law. But if it's not a law... They didn't break a law. If they did break a law and you revoke their license, fine. It's a law. I don't know if it's a law or not. If it's not and you do it, then you give an argument to the other side to come in and say, well, you, isn't you, aren't you doing this? Aren't you doing that? Oh, I thought you were for not censorship, all this other stuff. There, first of all, yesterday I'm talking to um, uh, Frank from uh, uh, Gays Against Groomers. I don't know if you're familiar with of Gays course, Against Groomers. Yes. They do a very good job. And, and Frank and I were trying to get a time. He's the executive director to get him on the podcast. I'm looking forward to having the conversation with him uh, uh, for him to give his perspective on how he feels about this. These guys do a very good job, and I want to learn more about them. You know, if it is a law, then you can prevent the kid. You can you can enforce it. If it's not, parents are uncomfortable with, you know, drag queens being shown to kids. But then your argument is, well, shouldn't the parent have the decision? The kid didn't get an Uber go there. It's the parent's decision. You want to take your kid and watch a scary movie or something? You took the risk. It says... Rated R, except with what? Parental guidance or PG-13. But if you got parental guidance, whatever, you can go watch the movie. The parent took the risk. This is a form of that is kind of what you're saying. But I think the argument this is more like X, though. It's what? It's more like rated X, where you can't take a kid to porno. I don't think it's soft porn because I don't think there's anything. Uh, uh, I don't think it's soft. I think this would probably be considered rated R. Even NC-17 is when they show, you know, two getting naked and, you know, but I think this is an R thing that the parent took the risk. Regardless of it, regardless of it, trust me when I tell you this. DeSantis taking the position, the people who are saying, I can't believe this, he was never going to get their vote anyway. Yeah. So he's not losing or gaining anybody there. But the people that were sitting there that were for him, who are parents with kids, they're like, dude, I don't care whether it is or it's not. I like the fact that it's defending something like this. He got those people that will support him, which is that's right. the vote you want anyways. And, and this is, I mean, look, it's no secret that DeSantis has his, his whole agenda is the war on the woke. This Florida is where woke comes to die. DeSantis is basically revealing his playbook for 2024, okay? Anything to trans, I'm out on that. Against it. Boom. Ukraine, we're getting out of there. He's revealing what he stands for, and he's delineating between himself with Biden, with Trump, and he's just 
he's showing us who he is. And by the way, I, I don't I don't think many people would agree that they want young kids around trans stuff. I think there's going to be over 50% majority that are going to support this. I think my only question is, isn't it up to the parents to make that decision, not the government? Well, I, I think it depends on how comfortable you are with what kids are being allowed to see. Because at a certain point, we're gonna everyone would agree that if you're giving a kid like drugs or alcohol, uh, we're gonna take that kid away from the parent. On the other hand, if they're just showing them, you know, always sunny in Philadelphia, no, you know, very few people are even that's not appropriate for amazing kids, show. Yes, very few people are gonna say, all right, like let's call CPS. Or, Isn't that the libertarian argument? That's the libertarian argument. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, right. I'm, I'm, right. with the most, most perspective. So the question is, what are you comfortable with? What, maybe it's different on a state by state basis the difference is well, you're right that a majority of people aren't for the trans stuff with kids but this is constantly being portrayed in the corporate press as just simply anti-LGBT they're not acknowledging or addressing the content of these shows it's not a guy in a dress singing some nice song and it's nice wholesome family entertainment it's explicitly sexually uh, suggestive uh, performances and sexually explicit material and that is very different from how if you watch The View you're going to perceive what's happening yeah, by the way, again, for me, uh, if you're campaigning, you ha you have to take some risks. Yes. And and DeSantis is taking the right risks. Watch two conversations he's in, which is exactly what you need to do if you want to create momentum. Mm -hmm. One, you got Republicans to vote against you and disagree with you. Rubio, Haley, yep. you know, what, uh, 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 Cheney, yeah, uh, Ukraine, phenomenal. You have one position. That's a risk. The other one, hey, we're doing this to these guys. That's a risk. Who am I gaining? The millions of people that are also asking, why are we sending all this money to Ukraine while we have a bank going out of business here? Why, why, why are we having our kids be exposed to transgender? I'm sorry, I'm not good with this. So I think he's taking the right risks. There is risks. He has to take it. W if I ask you right now, what's Nikki Haley's position? Give it to me. Give me one p risk Nikki Haley's taking. What's her position? Give me one risk Marco Rubio's taking. What's his position? Give me one risk Liz Cheney's taking. What's her position? The only risk Liz Cheney took is what? January After the comments 6th. being made about her father... He turned against January 6th. That was a risk she took because she'll never get MAGA. But Liz Cheney is better off today becoming a Democrat than staying a, you know, what do you call her, a rhino Republican? Yeah. I don't know where you put her, where she's at. So yeah, she the risk she rhino. took, that is also a risk, but that's yeah. a big risk. She, They thought Lincoln Project was going to be bigger than it actually ended up right. becoming. Well, not necessarily. Right. I think and she got crushed in her election. She, got she didn't win. That, yeah, but, the risk but, reward yeah, did not we, work out but for we all, her. We, it kind of did because we all know her name. She's very well positioned to get a book deal, to be a pundit. If so, that's what you're solving. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. If, if she's solving, solving for becoming, for. being a congresswoman, then it, it was a Fair. horrible risk. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, she's got the Cheney money, Cheney name. She has other paths to power. She's she wants, a long if she wants to get her show on MSNBC, right. she just signed that deal exactly. locked in. Exactly. I She'd would be like to do or the view. I would like to do two business stories and then we wrap up if that's okay with you guys. Tom, Mark Zuckerberg on how to run a company in 2023. This is a Wall Street Journal story. Uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has announced an update vision for the company in a year of efficiency focused on cutting costs and improving productivity. That this comes after a year of slow growth. And economic uncertainty. The company plans to cut 10,000 jobs over multiple rounds of layoffs while leaving an additional 5,000 open positions unfilled. It will eliminate middle management and flatten its corporate hierarchy by converting many managers into employees with no supervisory responsibilities. In other words, an anarchy. Low priority projects will be canceled <laughs> and internal tools will be strengthened to help software engineers write code faster. The company will also pause new remote work applications and request to transfer to another office through the first half of the year as some employees have performed better in person. However, Meta is committed to allowing both remote and hybrid work. Tom, thoughts? I, I found this to be like the death of a thousand cuts. Yeah. Um, he's pouring money into this hole um, called the Ukraine war. I, I, I mean, um, metaverse. <laughs> 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 and um, so he's doing that. And then they've laid off some people. Now, wait a minute. We have to, the year of efficiency, it's just a year of job cuts. He's trying to align what was this bloated cost with the economic reality, the revenue they bring in, cutting 10,000 jobs and closing 5,000 open jobs. It's, He's basically he's showing that this company has been completely caught out and now he's having to walk back and reoptimize. 
and he's not getting any, number one. And the reason they're having to do that, he's not getting any traction on the metaverse. But actually, they had a pretty good Q4 that showed signs of light that with the right number of folks, they still are a volcano of ad money, uh, which is good. But the, the humorous part for me is pausing new remote work applications. So let's, let's read that. Pause new remote work applications. No one is getting permission to work remote anymore. And then some employees have performed better in person. And then, then to, to quell the revolt before it happens. However, we're committed to allowing both remote and hybrid work. So I, I, think, I, I think Mark is sort of an enigma wrapped in a contradiction these days. Michael. I don't know that. I, listen, I'm no Mark Zuckerberg. He knows his business and his company infinitely better than I do. But from my understanding of social media and social media dynamics, I don't know how you turn the ship around, because once some uh, uh, internet um, social media site is regarded as kind of outdated or you know grandma, it becomes a lot harder to get the kids, which are what you, it's kind of like cigarettes, right? You want that young generation to kind of keep it going to sustain it. I haven't been on Facebook in a couple of years. I know for a lot, I, I got, I, I don't. No joke. No. It's, if you go to, do you use Instagram or no? I use Instagram, okay. Facebook.com slash Michael Miles. You could see my last post like, a couple of years ago. I, it hasn't hurt. It hasn't hurt my my. Uh, Why haven't you though? What's your What's your reason? I do, I I was. It drove me crazy that he changed it so I couldn't see everyone's updates in a reverse chronological order. That you're going to curate my feed for me. It's like this isn't what I want. I want to see everyone who I follow. You'll see all their posts. How many fans do you have on Facebook right now? I have no idea. I'm sure thousands. Uh, can you see the number? Well, you don't have a fan page. That's just your personal. Do you yes. have a fan page or no, no? I don't have a fan page. Let, Michael, I think you ought to consider having a fan page. Let somebody monitor it, not even you doing it. Have somebody add your clips. Only reason I'm saying this, if it's not important, don't do it. Right. You you are a brand that could generate an additional 10 to 20 a month off of Facebook. Okay. If it's not, it's important to you. Don't worry about it. But you, you'll blow up on, on Facebook and the monetization is actually working effectively. But good point to say who's even using that, right? That's kind of what you're right, saying. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it's certainly not like something that's regarded as a cutting edge or hip or anything yeah. like that. It's so really, how, do you, how do you do that? I mean, I don't, it's very hard. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you, how do you, uh, Tom, the question becomes, he makes a good point. How do you make it cool again, right? Because to me, you know, you know how sometimes... Uh, a, a parent screwed up with the kids and they try to win the kids over and they lower the standards. Well, guys, moving forward, you don't have to make your bet. Thank you. That you didn't you didn't you didn't improve your situation here, right. right? Hey, moving forward, babe, in our relationship, I will be more, you know, XYZ. No, no, you, you didn't make yourself more attractive. I think there needs to be a vision that's attractive to get a new market. Facebook is officially the company that buys companies right before they're about yeah. to blow up, and that's the brand. Yep. And you've talked about that before, but how do you make Facebook cool again? That's um, the trillion dollar question. It's like the I, old I don't spice think commercial. you can because yeah. you know those little, um, you know, the, the, they're on T-shirts and everywhere, and it shows evolution where you have the 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 primate, and then he slowly starts to stand up, and then he's walking. Well, basically, you can look at social media like that, and you've got AOL, then you got Friendster, then you got MySpace, and you got Facebook. I don't think you go back. I think once a new generation decides that that is the arcade, social media has proven. Let me say that as proven that once a generation turns its back on the yeah. prior and goes to the forward, that's it. I mean, ask the people at Snapchat who are sitting there every morning at church praying for TikTok to be shut down in the United States so that they have a chance <laughs> yeah. to be rejuvenated. Yeah. It, I don't think you turn it around, Pat. And that's why you hearing things like we're going to the... I think Mark knows it. And that's why he doubled down on the metaverse. Call it dumb, call it smart, call it what you will. But he's doubling down because he needs a new play. And now they're coming out and saying, we're going to make this... Um, open format, you know, messaging platform with interrelated uh, relevance to the messages. Okay, so why don't you just say you're trying to make a Twitter competitor at some point, and that's what you're working on in the back room. Let me, let I don't think you can turn back the clock. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I think you can. I think you can, and I think you believe you can as well. But, but I think the, the gift, Tom, uh, uh, the gift of doing that, Mark doesn't have. Okay, just like like you know you know what Truth Social needs. Uh, first of all, they need a Trump. Uh, they needed uh, uh, Elon to not buy Twitter. That screwed up Truth Social. The day he bought Twitter, it's over with. Right, that was game over. Yep, sure. But but take Sheryl Sandberg outside of Facebook. What's Facebook? Nothing. Take look at the names I'm about to tell you. Take Sheryl Sandberg out. It doesn't have the valuation it has. Number two. Take who's the guy that came from Napster? What was his name? The the Napster Sean guy. Parker. Sean Parker. Take Sean Parker out. What's the vision? 
Sean Parker was the vision. Okay, Sheryl Sandberg was the uh, money ads. The the twin, uh, whatever the uh, the uh, Those yeah, guys yeah. were the idea. Zuck is an operator and an executor and a driver. That's what he'll do. Mm-hmm. But he's not that guy. So I think he needs to find the next. Give you a perfect idea. Most people, when you think about Fox News, you ask the average person Fox News, who's the founder of Fox News? They're going to think the guy that's the founder of Fox News is who? They're Rupert say, Murdoch. No, no. If you ask the Roger ask, Ailes. Ask, they have no idea. They have no idea. They have no idea. They have no idea the guy's Australian with oh. an Australian accent. Rupert Murdoch is an Australian guy with an Australian accent. What took fate, What took Fox to be a behemoth was a guy named Roger Ailes. Correct. Okay, mm-hmm. You take Roger Ailes out, it's not going to happen. The best thing Zuck could do right now, the best thing Zuck could do right now is stop coming up with ideas. It's not your strength. Go find the biggest, badass, innovator, creative that wants to prove a point. Give him a fat salary with a big upside. Let them come in. Rather than coming up with ideas, go find your Roger Rails. Go find your next Sandberg. Go find your next recruit. This is recruiting season. I think the approach he's taking is not going to work out because he's not a vision guy. He's an executor. And, And by the way, Zucks are very, very hard to find. Very, very hard to find. There's a reason why he's worth what he's worth but he can go find the other guys. Mm-hmm. They're out there. I don't know a single person, and obviously that's a very bad metric for saying something yeah. like this, but I, I just want to put that caveat, who's on the metaverse or spends time Exactly. There. And I, a lot of my friends are big influencers in very many yeah. fields. If I don't have one data point to the contrary, that says something. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's my, I may be wrong. All I'm saying is go recruit a guy like that. You have plenty of money and attract the platform to give it to somebody. And by the way, that guy becomes a savior. Just, just 20 years ago, not even 20 years ago. 1976, when did Apple get started? 72 or 76? It's, uh, uh, what, what year did Apple get started? 1970 what? What year does it say? 76. April okay. 1976. April Fool's, uh, 1976. Mm-hmm. Pretty wild. So they get started 76. And an accidental millionaire book comes out. Trashing uh, jobs, right? And then what happens to him? He gets fired. And then Apple's about to die. Scully, the guy that he brings from Pepsi, ends up getting firing him, right? Jobs goes to uh, uh, Home Fries. What do you call it? Uh, uh, Pixar. And he sells Pixar to who? Disney. Then Apple comes in. He starts working next computer with next Ross computer. Pro. Yes. So then they come in. Then they bring him back. And then, boom, it takes off. I think Facebook needs to go find recruited talent. By the way, watch what happened here yesterday. This is 16 hours ago. U.S. threatens ban if TikTok Chinese owner... Don't sell steaks. Okay, this is all over the place. Axios wrote it. NBC wrote it. They wrote it. If if and this wasn't this isn't something that was started by uh, uh, Biden. Trump proposed this, and I don't know if you remember. At one point, there's a bunch of people that were going to buy it. You know, I don't know what the company. Twitter was, I think one. I, there was a couple companies yeah, that yeah, were going to buy this thing. guy. Uh, TikTok. I, I want to say it's not a bad buy, but for Facebook, but I don't think it's a good buy for Facebook because they already got it. It's, it's Instagram. I think this is a very good buy. If Elon buys TikTok, oh well, I, I don't think it matters who owns TikTok. I think it matters what TikTok is connected to. And if right. Elon buys it, he'll find it'll be TikTok files, and you'll see everything. If if they force, so tic- he would pull it out of there. Tom, one hundred percent, pull out the China. One hundred. Look at what Vivek Ramaswamy's campaign is right now. You know what he wants to do? Did you hear what he said yesterday? No. Actually, I, he said I, a lot of things. I. Can you go to Twitter real quick? Here's what he said yesterday, which I found very interesting. So you know what Vivek wants to do? Here's what Vivek wants to do. What Vivek tweeted yesterday, this is the kind of stuff that your, your, your life is on the line. So, so let me find this tweet here, what he said. He says, if you vote me in, he wants to do to the U.S. government what Twitter, Twitter Elon Musk did with Twitter files. Huh. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. They, they, they would, oh, they'd, put him up, they'd put him six feet under in two of seconds. Of course they would. So, but he about? came out and he says... I will be exposing the FBI files, the this files. It's a very, uh, 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 you know, what's the word? Utopian idea yes, that, to have. I don't know. <laughs> he better not walk through the kitchen at the Ambassador Hotel. Yeah. He, like, what are you talking? Yeah. Look, he is. He's got guts. He's got audacity. And I don't even mind. Like, right there. Just as Elon Musk did at Twitter, as president, I will release the state action files oh, from the federal okay, government, yeah, yeah. exposing every instance where the feds pressured companies to take constitutionally prohibited actions. I, I like this. This is good. But if if Elon buys TikTok, combine TikTok and Twitter, 
I don't know. There's something attractive about that. But will Biden and his camp allow TikTok to be sold to Elon? You know, that's not going to be happening. They're going to get in the way. Well, whoever gonna... buys it has to untangle it from all that. Yes. That word By keeps where? reappearing. The entanglement Yeah, word. just like it's Chris Rock's favorite word right now. So, anyways, I don't know what's going to happen there, but uh, that was the one story. Tom, I'll do the mortgage story, and I'll give that one to you, and we'll wrap up. So, page eight. Let's see here. Uh, mortgage demand rises despite volatile interest rates. This is a CNBC story. Mortgage demand increased for the second week in a row with the total application volume rising by 6.5% compared to the previous week. According to Mortgage Bankers Association, despite mortgage rates being higher, mortgage applications to purchase a home increased by 7% for the week. And homeowners, home buyers concerned rates will continue to rise. However, applications to refinance a home were uh, seven, uh, 74% lower than a year ago. It's a big number. The average contract rate... For 30-year fixed mortgage with conforming loan, balances decreased to 6.71% from 6.79. That's not a big number. But rates were large, largely largely higher for most of the week before dropping sharply on Friday due to news of Silicon Valley Bank failure. So is this like, Tom, just a small little movement here? Is this like, you know, what do you think this is? Yeah, th th this is a blip. And I dove into this because I saw the headline. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, and to, to find out what it is. And th th this was CNBC making a headline where there really isn't one. Um, and I dove into the stuff Diana Olaf was talking about. And what happened was there's always buyers right on the edge. Even in a bad market, there's a percent of buyers that are right on the edge. Yeah. And when they saw the madness happening with SVB and they hear, you know, the week prior is what really drove it. It really wasn't SVB. It was driven the week prior when everyone was trying to talk Powell. You know, buddy, you don't need to do 25 you need to do 50. And it was Larry Summers on the weekend and all the weekend news shows. Larry Summers says he really needs to put a half a point on this, not just a quarter point. People on the edge were reacting to that, saying, well, if we're going to do it now, we better do it now. Take 6.71. Otherwise, it's going to be 7. This wasn't the market moving back to buy houses. This is people on the edge, Pat. It's on a blip. They jumped in. They locked at 6.71, and they bought some houses. And also, there was an increase in sale of newly built homes in that last week, which is temporary because you know what that was? If you're a home builder like Toll Brothers or Lanier, Pat, what can you always do? You can use part of the home price to arbitrage the rate. Tell you what, you go get the rate, and what I'll do is I'll pay one point. So instead of 6.75, you'll get six and a quarter. And so home builders pushed a little blip on that too. But this is a blip. This is not a change in the mortgage market, according to everything that I dove into. I, I, I'm not particularly informed on this specific issue, but the housing market has been historically kind of boom and bust. Uh, I know Austin specifically, uh, the rates the for renting and for home ownership went through the roof in the last couple of years. Now they seem to kind of, if you look at Zillow, which I kind of do regularly, all the home prices have an arrow going down. So the market is kind of correcting itself. But again, the, the mortgages and banks are obviously so extremely interconnected that if banks start failing, this is going to have some kind of cascading effect. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what the mortgage brokers are telling their potential clients That's a great right question. now. Because in any sale, it comes down to what? Urgent Urgency and scarcity, right. right? So, hey, you know, the rates just dropped. They're not going to drop anytime soon. Yeah. You see what Powell's doing out yeah. there. Their uh, rates are expected to go up. You're lucky if you get it at six and a half You're at right. this point. That's a great I, yeah, point. That's a I, great I know. Point. I know. Hey, you know, we, we can't go back to a year ago where you could have got three and a half. Right. You should have chose then. Now we're at six and a half. It could be seven and a half next year. Time to go. Time to go. Time to and go. Inflation around the corner. Too. I read yeah. it was a blip, and that's exactly if I was a mortgage broker, what I'd be saying to people: We don't know where this is going to go, but it doesn't look good. You've been right on the edge here. Why don't you pull the trigger yep, on the home? Yep. Let's get you locked in. Yeah, but blip. you know, if I'm that guy that was looking to buy a house a year ago and I missed the missed the rush, and I could have gotten at three and a half, now you're trying to sell me on six and a half. Yeah, that's an uncomfortable situation. Were you going to say something? No, no, I, I, okay. I completely agree. This, this, well, it's, it's trying to be Nostradamus here. Gang, uh, this has been a blast. Uh, two things. One, uh, go order the book. The White Pill uh, uh, came out December 1st, five stars uh, 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 by Michael Malice. Let's put the link below in the description as well as the chat for people to go pick up. Again, go pick up the book, White Pill, uh, Michael Malice, A Tale of Good and Evil. 
Uh, I got a surprise gift as well for you. It just arrived, your gift, two days ago. And I, rather than doing it on your birthday, you were out of town. I want to do it right now before it's too late. And I know your birthday was a minute ago, but it just arrived. Can we open the door and get this yeah. gift for this guy? What is happening? Right I think you're going to like it. I hope you like it. This is uh, 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 what is happening? It's a gift. Dude, dude, put it behind him so at least the oh, audience wow. can see. Hopefully he likes this gift. Oh, bro, are you freaking kidding me, Open it up. Open it up. Open it up. Let's see if you like this gift or not. It's my birthday today. (laughs) We ordered a bed for your wife. (laughs) All right, let's see. So the, the, the reason why I got you this gift is for obvious reasons. Okay? So this is a... Isaiah Thomas autographed jersey Wow! for Adam Sauce because Adam grew up your pops, Detroit. Happy birthday, buddy. That's the bad boy. Beautiful, that display This is is such a sick gift. Isaiah Thomas, everyone was a Michael Jordan guy. Everyone was a Larry Bird guy. I was always Isaiah. I like the hipster aspect of that. Yeah, thank you. This is... I appreciate that. What's crazy, I only own one other jersey. And it's an Isaiah Thomas jersey, Seriously. but it's not framed. Now you've got Beautiful. an autograph frame. Yeah. Put it up. Uh, put it up in your bed. Isaiah, if you ever see this, Zeke, <laughs> put it up <laughs> in your bed. I put it over your. So bed. cool. Okay. All right. Anyways, uh, we had a blast, Michael. Once again, thanks for coming out. I know it was too early for you, but we had a good time. <laughs> Hopefully, we woke you up, and I know you woke a lot of us up as as well. Florida's where wealth goes to die. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> well played. It used to, but it's changed. <laughs> it used to, but it's changed. Anyways, gang, have a great uh, weekend, and we will do this again next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.